grades. So I believe students on our campus know best what's going on. And if students really feel that that's the case, I think we should really look into this more. Deferred recruitment would have negatively affected my decision to go Greek. So this was a question that was on a one to five point scale, one being uh, would not have affected negatively, five being would have. Uh, and a lot of people chose either the middle ground or the uh, agreeing with the statement that deferred recruitment would have negatively uh, affected their decisions to go Greek. Given what's uh, one of the proposes in the, um, the, the proposals, proposes is to defer uh, recruitment um, I, I think that's a little bit concerning that a lot of people feel that way. So um, this is about the current state of Greek life recruitment. As you guys know, the numbers were down um, and people felt it. They expressed this. Five means you strongly agree that the Greek life task force has negatively affected recruitment. Again, Greeks, non-Greeks felt this way. People saw it and we have a great breakdown on the next slide about that. So if you look right here, affiliated with the Greek organization, five means strongly agreed. It's color coded based on the number of responses. Strongly agreed for affiliated with a Greek organization was the most popular answer, but those are the medians right there. So around, it's around a 4.5 for Greek organizations, like a 4.1 or 4.2 for non-Greek affiliated. So as you can see, students overwhelmingly feel that a lot of the Greek Life Task Force his efforts have negatively impacted recruitment and we feel like this is something that needs to be addressed immediately because this is hurting our houses in the short term in terms of recruitment, membership, culture, you name it, finances. It's something that needs to be addressed. Okay, so we're gonna do a quick activity here um, where you stand if the statement I say applies to you, so if you believe this. So let's start off easy. Stand if you are Greek. supports Greek life. Oh. <laughs> All right, sit down. Stand if you as a student feel supported by the administration. All right, sit down. Stand if you believe the university's decisions negatively impacted recruitment this past year. Sit down. Stand if you believe deferred recruitment is a detriment to the Greek community. Right, sit down. Stand if you believe Greek life housing and off-campus housing should be an option for Summer Arch. to report a sexual assault for fear of getting added as a statistic to the Greek Life Task Force report. All right, stand if you would feel discouraged to report a sexual assault for fear of getting added as a statistic to the Greek Life Task Force report. All right, you guys can sit. Stand if you would be hesitant to invoke the Good Samaritan policy because it could still harm your, your organization. All right, sit down. Stand if you believe that Greek life provides value to the RPI community.
sit down. And one final one. Stand if your Greek chapter is one of the main reasons that you are still at RPI. Alrighty, thank you so much. All right, let's take our seat, shall we? All right, so this is how it's gonna work. Um, so as we are assembled here, uh, we're your panel right now. Um, we wanna hear your concerns. Uh, I'm gonna pose two questions right now. One, what are your concerns about what's going on on campus? Two, what do you want us to do about it? So uh, we have two mics right there. Please come down, please answer your question, I mean, ask your questions. If there's anything that we can't answer, um, I, we've invited, um, VP Kolb, um, Special Assistant Strong, VP Kamworski, and Dean Apgar to answer those questions. But again, uh, we want to hear what's going on and we really want to hear your thoughts because at the end of the day, we're your advocates. So, go ahead. I'm very concerned that RPI's concern about sexual assault among Greeks way of papering over the fact that they don't really advocate many resources towards handling sexual assault, and many have reported that they've handled it just quite poorly, um, by slut shaming victims, by uh, encouraging them to leave RPI, um, by not separating them from their accuser, sorry, like not separating the accused from the accuser. These are all things that have been brought up to me in the past, and there's also no real pipeline for which to people can get off-campus resources because of RPI's deeper pockets policy where they'll only do an external resource if it has a better liability insurance than the school. All of these things are really concerning to me and aren't really a Greek life specific issue. To my understanding, um, that really the only main Greek life member that is an undergrad um, that was part of the task force is Fish. So it is to my understanding that there were supposed to be more members of, oh, and Emily Walker, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but it is to my understanding that there were supposed to be more members of the Greek community involved with the task force directly, either sitting as part of the task force, either and I was wondering um, how it has negatively affected the ability of the IFC and Panhel to react to what's going on. Well, to answer this question, um, over the summer when the announcement was made for the Greek Left Task Force, both our boards, IFC and Panhel, submitted a selection of nominations for both the task force and the discussion panel itself. Um, these are comprised of members of executive boards chapter, from chapters all across campus. Um, there were two direct nominations from our board, that was myself and Bish for the task force, and we submitted a representative from our board for the discussion panel, and that was Tomas Provancher. Besides that, we had representatives that were direct, uh, directly nominated from like previous presidents of chapters for, from IFC's end, um, previous, previous members of student government that were in Greek houses, for instance, Matt Rand was one of our nominations for the task force itself, but ultimately the only people that were selected from our list to, to serve on the task force and the discussion panel were myself and Bish. Uh, yes, so regarding the reasons that were stated for forming the Greek Life Task Force outlined in Dr. Jackman's email, there were five of them, abuse of alcohol and abuse of drugs, the first two. Those ones in the Greek Life Task Force's recommendations, the only thing that I could find that referenced that in any way was adhering to the National Interfraternity Council's guidelines on alcohol. Uh, please correct me if I'm wrong, but do we not follow them already? So the current NIC's policy regarding hard alcohol, uh, regarding alcohol is that there's a ban on hard alcohol. Um, well, before all this, we actually didn't have any restrictions on alcohol. Um, so I, I guess regarding the task force and what's going on with that, you know, we're adhering to the NIC's policies. And now that, uh, I guess as of September, uh, we affiliated with the NIC. So those policies carry over now. Uh, next two point, next point, uh, instances of racism and discrimination. Uh, looking through the task force's report, I could find no direct reference to that in any way. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure how to answer that, but um, on I this campus, I do believe that there are instances of discrimination and racism. 
Yeah. Trying to solve those issues with something that does not touch on those issues at all, it seems rather counterintuitive. We agree. <laughs> we 100 percent agree. Um, I believe that, um, and some, some of I, I've talked to some of you guys about it, but I think what we have in the task force report, you know, doesn't fully solve our issues with racism and discrimination on this campus. I think we need to come together as a community and really start to hammer down those issues and really fix them ourselves. Uh, it's very important that we do so. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, it, we don't need an external source telling us that we need to fix this. We need to start looking inwards and start doing it ourselves. Okay, uh, Josh, do you want to go? Because it has even more stuff to say. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. Uh, good evening. Um, my name is Jacques. I'm the president of Delta Phi. I want to say a few words about something that's been affecting our chapter lately. Um, for a little bit of context, my chapter is in a really excellent spot right now. Uh, something amazing is happening. We have bought a new house, and we are working to have it renovated so that we'll finally have a place to Well, congratulations, first of all. Thank you, thank you. We were able to do this because of the incredible generosity of our alumni. They funded a large portion of the project. However, to finish funding it, uh, we've been looking to get a mortgage or a loan to cover the remaining costs. Even though there are two of them, we still need that. Um, however, every local bank we reached out to to help us with this has not been willing to work with us. The, one of the primary reasons they stated is they feel that RPI has been hostile to Greek life and they don't think that our existence and continuity is assured. And that's not what we should expect. <laughs> clearly, clearly, this is a problem. Um, as a way of dealing with this, we reached out to a few members of the RPI administration, and we were able to get a letter from one of them endorsing us in our endeavors and saying that, no, in fact, they are not trying to get rid of us. We're immensely thankful to them because that is the only reason we've been able to enter into any kind of negotiations whatsoever. Um, even though we are grateful, we still think this is a problem because we think the success of our chapter should speak for itself as to our own longevity and our place on RPI's campus. <coughs> We've been incredibly successful as a chapter, and I'm proud to announce that like, even though recruitment last semester was late, it was shortened, it was during midterms, we still had our most successful recruitment of the past three years during that time. We still get good grades, we still have five stars, we do our community service, we're still true to those values on which we were founded, and we think that should be evidence that we're here to stay. So it saddens me that we had, that the only thing that stood between us and even the possibility of getting this mortgage was endorsement from someone else. Uh, of course, let me be clear about this. We really do support the task force and what they're doing and we appreciate all the effort that they've put into it. We're really grateful. I acknowledge, we acknowledge that the Greek community does have problems and that we do need to work to fix them and we're committed to changing. Uh, we just ask, whatever the future holds, whatever the implementation of the recommendations is, we ask that it be wholly positive, that it both support the community explicitly and also implicitly through the implementation of the recommendations. When outsiders in the future are looking in at what's going on here at RPI, we want them to be able to see RPI supporting and bolstering its Greek community, and we want them to see the Greek community working together with the task force to enact positive, lasting changes, and not hostility towards the Greek community. That is, that is what we'd like. Thank you, thank you for listening. Go ahead, Roger. Thank you. 
I just wanted to follow up on what Jock had mentioned. Um, I'm one of Jock's fraternity brothers, and we are working, we've been working very hard to get a new house. It's been um, 23 years since we've had a house, and that, that's to the credit of the alumni who still feel very, very passionately about their organization, just like your alumni, your alumni feel about yours. Um, I just wanted to thank Dean Apgar because he's the one who wrote the letter. I contacted him and said, look, the publicity that is being generated from the situation is really hurting us. It would be really helpful to us if you could write a letter explaining that the purpose of the task force is to help to make sure that Greek life continues long into the future, that we don't do something, that somebody doesn't do something stupid and end it for all of us. That's the whole purpose for this. Um, but I, so I wanted to take a moment to thank Dean, uh, Dean Apgar for doing that for us. That's made a big difference. This is supposed, I'm not supposed to mention this yet, but it looks like we have one or two banks that are now in a position to, uh, to work with us. The only thing that, the major thing that was holding it up was the bad publicity because they felt, you know, it doesn't look like Greek life is going to continue at RPI for very much longer. So what are we gonna do with a fraternity house without a, on a, on a campus that has no fraternities? That was their feeling. That's the negative impact of uh, the publicity. So at any rate, thank you, Dean Apgar. This is less directed at IFC and Pan Hill and more directed at the administrators. It's more of a rhetorical question. Um, but so, so we all showed up here tonight to show our support for the Greek community. And when I've heard all three of you speak at different things, whether it was the Greek Leadership Summit or even before when introducing yourselves, you guys always talk about Dr. Jackson and talk about how you guys are representing a significant amount of her interests, although obviously you guys are very involved in the process and lead parts of this process. My question to you is, if we could take time out of our schedules to come here tonight, then why isn't President Jackson here tonight as well? regarding social events. So despite the lack of a Greek social events this semester and this whole year, uh, students are still looking for social outlets. And they've been going to lengths sort of wandering around Troy looking for a bit like random apartment parties. And this concerns me because of the many recent of instances of um, hate speech, harassment, assault, and many other things. I've heard stories about random people just walking in um, with underage kids and causing a whole scene. So I wanna bring to everyone's attention how uh, unsafe this has become. And I feel like without, um, no, with no risk management and no policies to hold people in apartments accountable to, uh, there's, no, there's no way to keep the students and my peers safe. And when I've experienced all Greek social functions, we've had risk management plans, sober monitors, many things to make sure that everybody stays safe. And I'm just worried that we are not gonna have this anymore. I just wanted to ask a quick question uh, because I literally don't know. Was Dr. Jackson invited to come tonight? No. She was? I, I don't know. Well, like this <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Oh. Um, I mean, the event was open for anyone to come. So, like, where Greek life is such a hot topic on our campus. So, so just to be clear, we were, we were all personally invited and, and we're happy to be here. And I, I think that, you know, to, to Dr. Jackson's defense, I think if she knew she was invited, maybe she'd be here. So.
Uh, so I'd first like to echo the last speaker's comments. Uh, they were very similar to what I would say. Um, furthermore, I would like to bring up, uh, what was it? Uh, the implementation of class that is discussed in the Greek Life Task Force. In speaking to the alumni of my fraternity, it is my understanding that that has been attempted to be implemented for the past 10 years. I don't really see any direct benefit that we have from implementing it. I also don't really see how this will go any different from last time. I understand that this time there's now supposed to be a dedicated person to making that happen. However, in previous years, it's my understanding that there were administrators who were dedicated to making this happen. So why should I believe it's any different now? So honestly, that was like one question a lot of us had is regarding class. Um, and, and I think deferring it to Ricky John Lewis here or any, any other administrators, kind of explain what class is to the RPI because, you know, raise your hand if you know what class is. So, you know, the issue is that not every single hand is up. Uh, and so if we can't get across a, knowing what class is, you know, that, that's an issue and, and that, you know, Classes being implemented via the task force. So, if it's possible for you guys to explain what class is, that would be great. One other little comment that I'd like to make. So, we actually did do a survey of people uh, who are RPI students about what they're, they know, whether they know what class is. Um, approximately under 5% of respondents said that yes, they can definitely say they know what class is. This included RAs who actually do class programming, members of student government, anyone who walked into Commons. Let me say a couple things. Um, I'm new at RPI, so what I know of class is what you're actually helping shape. And I think um, if you don't know what class is, then I think we have some work to do. And for me, as the new vice president, what I want to do is make sure that you have the best student experience in the country. Um, and I'll come back to class in a minute. Um, I would, but I'd like to actually ask a question. How many of you are proud to be at RPI? All right, good. I'm going to answer the question. But part of the answer is we want you to be proud, as we have Roger just talking about this a minute ago, as a proud, engaged student and a proud, engaged alum. Um, class, for those of you who don't know, is, or for maybe you don't think you know, um, is the student experience. And the way we implement class, class is cascaded throughout your four years, it's clustered. And our design is to make sure that you have the advocacy and support through a variety of services to be successful both in the classroom and outside of the classroom. But what does it do? Hopefully it helps you develop, grow, learn, be contributing members of society, make a difference in your field. Um, and if you have feedback on that, that's one of the things that we have implementation task force around. We're gonna have working groups around everything we talked about, all the feedback. So if you don't understand, oh, excuse me, if you don't understand class, we're gonna work on that. If we're not doing a good enough job communicating what class is or the benefits and the outcomes, we're gonna work on that. We are deeply committed to working on these things. Whether it's ARCH or class or Title IX violations or alcohol and drugs, that's why we're all here. That's why the president called for this. So feel free to ask the questions and we're gonna be committed to working together with you. As we heard earlier, this is a partnership. Um, also, please. Just as a note, please be respectful of the questions. You know, it's the, the more hostile it is, it's harder for us to answer the questions. You know, and I'm sure we're gracious to be here tonight. So please, please, really appreciate it. You know, you're welcome. Know, uh, uh, please be respectful. Thank you. Uh, one other thing they have. So regarding all of the recommendations of the task force, looking through them, one of them has a clear date and implementation strategy. That would be the deferred recruitment. The other ones have no date assigned to when they should be implemented, no concrete plan of implementation, uh, not even any real guess as to a plan when asked at the last forum that we had about the task force's report. So it seems as though this is basically, there is one goal in mind and then other things in addition to that, but one of those things is more thoroughly thought out than the others. Thank you. Uh, one of the recommendations in the task force report, I believe, referenced the Greek J 
board. Uh, could you guys talk about the current state of the Greek J board and its future related to Greek Life Task Force report? So currently as it stands, um, any cases which we would handle in terms of going through an appeal process would go directly through the school judicial process. So fundamentally we are currently just serving as an appeal board. And will that change with the recommendations in the Greek Life Task Force report? Unfortunate, uh, unfortunately that is to be determined. Thank the administration for being here, but my concern is directly with you guys. So at our like president's meeting with all the administration, you spoke about like the decrease in sexual assault related to Greek life and were boasting about it, but the overall sexual assaults on campus had increased. So my fear is that as, um, or the overall re sexual assaults reported increased. So my fear is that as drinking behaviors are becoming more dangerous where there's not event monitors, that no matter how many times we come and meet and come to talk to you guys, nothing's gonna change since, since it's not on campus and it's not in Greek housing, which is considered university housing, you guys aren't gonna wanna change anything because you're not as liable for it. That's my biggest concern. So, so I'm really glad that you, you pointed out that th there wasn't an increase necessarily in sexual assaults, right? We don't know how many sexual assaults occur. We know it's a drastically under-reported uh, circumstance. We know that we had an increase in the reports last year. Of those reports, we saw a decrease that were related to Greek life. Uh, it went from spring 2018, where about 47% of, of those cases were related, to <coughs> fall 19, where, or excuse me, fall 18, where it was about 10%. I don't know that we can draw anything from that small of a, of a uh, window, but you know, it, was, it was something that we did talk about at that president's meeting just to share some data. Um, we just left a, a task force meeting actually, I think probably the last one we'll have before the report is completely finalized and, and, um, and sent along to the president, in which we had, a, I think, a good conversation about this topic in particular. That what's in the report as a suggestion of what we should be doing to really address sexual misconduct, sexual assault, rape in fraternity and sorority in that Greek community, uh, the suggestion certainly isn't enough. And we don't think it is. In fact, there's almost nothing in this report that I would say goes far enough to really solve all the problems. We're looking at this as a, as a task force. I think we look at this entire report and the set of recommendations, including the one specific to the education required for all members of Greek life around sexual assault prevention as just a, a good kind of first start. Or maybe not even a good first start, just a start. And so we know there's a lot more that has to happen. There's a lot more that will happen. It's absolutely not something that we look at from a you know, return on investment perspective of what are we going to uh, have to pay out to, to address this. We're committed to addressing this. And so if you have suggestions, you know, my office, uh, our offices, We'd love to, to have those suggestions. We already have had a lot. We've done more than probably most people recognize already, but we're, we're willing to do a lot more than we have been. As you're doing these things, do you have intention for the rest of campus since the stats show that, because right now the Greek life seems to be the only area that's being targeted for it, and I think that's why a lot of the campus gets hurt since these are evidently all campus problems. Yeah, so that's a great question, and, and you know, I apologize if all I'm talking about is Greek life. You know, I'm just trying to address the question that you were presented at first, but yes, we've already uh, expanded the amount of education that's happening with uh, organizations through the union, with uh, significantly in, in athletics, because we know that you know that was also a place that it shows up nationally in terms of, of prevalence, and um, and you know again, these are just kind of the, the beginnings of what we expect will continue to be a growth in the, the prevention efforts across campus. I guess a bit of a premise, I'm a senior in a, my fraternity. I've seen what, I'm familiar with what Greek life contributes to the culture at RPI. So a significant portion of philanthropy that takes place at RPI is associated with Greek life. Is a home away from home for many students. We mentor new students that are adjusting, that are not adjusting to RPI well, and it provides a platform for students to gain leadership experience. 
My fraternity goes up and down uh, Pauling Avenue to rake up leaves. The grateful people do not call us those nice boys from Greek life. They call us those nice boys from RPI. However, in the four years that I've been here, I fail to see how RPI contributes back to Greek life. We, for some reason, are held to higher standards than other students with requirements and sanctions, such as having to have certain number of members in clubs, GPA requirements to join, and deferred recruitment. The administration does not hold any other clubs to standards like they do to us. In your words, to reciprocate how much Greek life contributes to RPI, what does RPI do for Greek life? So thanks for the question. Um, so here's a few things that are just kind of um, logistics and, and financial kind of investment. We will bill for your membership, your dues, your housing for any, any organization. Uh, we don't charge a fee for that. Uh, that's, that's a fee that we're... <laughs> <laughs> you can clap, it's okay. Don't stop, I saw somebody stop them from clapping. Uh, it's okay if they wanna clap. Uh, we, we've actually expanded the number of staff that we have so that we are providing more uh, advisement, trying to help you with recruitment, trying to make sure that people do understand that, that we're there for them. Um, we allow, first of all, this is a private institution. Many of you probably applied to a number of schools. Not all schools actually even recognize Greek life, let alone invest in it the way that we have. Um, we actually value Greek life a great deal. I understand the look on your face. From your perspective, maybe that's not true. However, if it were not something we value, we wouldn't be investing the way that we are. We could, as a private institution, say we're not going to recognize it anymore. In fact, when we opened up the, uh, the task force report for comments, you'd be surprised how many actually commented and said, why would you bother to recognize them anymore? And here's what was really shocking to me as a Greek. Some of those comments came from Greeks. So um, I listed a couple of things. Personally, let me tell you what I think the value is. Um, we have a relationship that has gone back for at least 150 years, 165 years, right? Uh, that relationship is a give and take. There's a great deal that we do, including things like billing, inspections of houses, you may see those inspections as things that we're doing to try to kind of make sure that you're, you're behaving. We're actually investing our resources and sending our staff out to privately owned houses to inspect them to make sure that they're safe because the city of Troy won't actually do that for you. Some of you know I've worked in other institutions where those cities actually did provide that service at a cost. And they would then, every time they found any kind of violation, fine you. We're not doing that. So we are providing a lot of services. I think that if, if you actually went back, had a conversation, looked at what we are investing in Greek life, it's considerably more than most other institutions that have a system. Again, personally, here's what I think the value of Greek life is. Some of what you listed. Yeah, it's a home away from home. It's family away from family. It's the support network that you provide. But that support network also has to be positive much more often than it is anything else. And when we look at the system, there's plenty of that. There's a lot of great representation of really positive experiences in Greek life, which is why we want to strengthen it, which is why we want to continue to make sure that it is relevant into the future. But we also have to be honest and recognize where we can improve. We're here listening because we want to hear you tell us how we can improve, and we're listening. I hope that you all are also listening to not only us, but some of your peers, your alumni, and others who have been involved in this process, when we're, we're giving you some feedback on here's areas that we think you need to improve on. One of the things that is, um, that I'm concerned about, and I know you had, you had a question in the survey, you had a stand up or sit down, and, and it was very powerful to, to see that results of the question about who, you know, how many of you think that the Greek Life Task Force is negatively impacting, impacting recruitment. Yeah, a lot of you said yes, almost everybody. If somebody was sitting, I'm sure you pushed them up. But, sorry, I can't help it. Just try to be funny once in a while. But here's the thing. What was negatively impacting IFC, especially recruitment, the previous five years? Because it hasn't been good. 
I want to make sure we help you with that. That's the investment. And if you think that our staff, you know, because I saw the look and I saw the, 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 if you think our staff, including me, we're not serving you, I want to hear it. I want to know how we can. Okay? Um, I have a quick question for you, building off of that point. So you alluded to the period of public comment, and there were over 400 comments that were submitted, but both members of the group community and non-group members. Can you remember? 400? Remind me how many num the number of comments submitted for? There were 324 individuals. Okay. Eight submitted approximately 430. Okay, uh, 430 comments. Um, so that period is designated to have us have us in our community and others in the non-green community have some semblance of a voice toward the later half of the task force report. Were any of those comments enough to make any changes in the report itself? There were no comments that resulted in a significant change to the recommendations though there were lots and lots of comments that will go to the implementation team for consideration. There were specific concerns about how things would be done, when they would be done, and by whom. The implementation team that will uh, be represented by our chapters will be a part of making that happen. Uh, do you have a timeline for said implementation team, like the formation of it, implementation, et cetera? Uh, I cannot give you that this evening because the task force just met. The task force report needs to go to President Jackson and shortly after that implementation will begin. So uh, Mr. Apgar, from your answer, I've got two things that you provide to Greek Life. You form the Greek Life task force and you provide safety inspections, is that all? Hi. <laughs> so the first is kind of a rhetorical question for my Panhellenic community. Did you guys know that our recruitment numbers raised 5% this year and retention numbers? <laughs> they did. So not everyone's suffering. And then as a second, sorry guys. <laughs> as a second point, I might have disagreements with like everyone else in this room about this. and. As much as standing in solidarity for what Greek life stands for means a lot, it might not change these recommendations. So for you guys sitting up here, can you give us an idea of what Panhel and ISC and what the presidents are doing for the community to help prepare for the changes that the recommendations might bring? So one of the things we're trying to do right now is to come up with a deferred recruitment plan that really won't hinder us completely. Um, so you, a lot of you all saw, probably saw the um, deferred recruitment plan that the OGLC put out yesterday, which I learned about yesterday. Um, that's besides the point. But we came up with our own plan, which we think would benefit Greek life a lot in terms of deferred recruitment if we do go that route. So that is one of the things that we are working on. And um, looks like Tori wants to talk more about other implementations. So I'll let her take it over. Take over. Okay, um, in terms of for like NPC um, for the stories, I'm looking into bringing an NPC um, consultant to our campus to help us adjust to the spring um, primary recruitment. Um, Caroline is gonna look into different ways that we can, you know, work through this. There are other schools so, who do have deferred recruitment, so, um, and a few of us were at a conference um, over spring break, so, we have some contacts. Um, we're gonna like. I'm going to be reaching out to both our MPC delegate um, about getting a consultant and reaching out to other presidents and BPRs so we can transition. Thank you. So I had two points. Um, the first one was actually they both relate to the task force presentation at the president's meeting a couple months ago. Uh, one of them was, in terms of the point on sexual assault and rape, the data that was used is based off, and now this may be an issue with the Title IX office, but it was based off when the reports were filed, not when the incident itself actually happened. And so I feel like it is just a gross skewing of the data, um, because say a sexual assault could have happened in spring of 2016, 
but it wasn't reported until fall 17, which is highly touted as the big sexual assault semester um, when the huge increase happened. Um, so I just feel like that the data is heavily skewed. Um, yeah. So my second point is I'm going to reiterate a question that I asked then. Um, we as Greeks are being looked upon, and this is the Greek Life Task Force, when on any given Friday or Saturday night, I actually personally invited you, Dean Apgar. I said, you can come sit on our front porch on any Friday or Saturday night, and you can look at all the gaggles of freshmen, sophomores, juniors, seniors, going to the apartment parties, going to sports team parties. Now, your response was, um, the administration is doing something to help lower what's going on with the academic teams. I guess my point is, and my question, since the beginning of this whole debacle, this has been the Greek Life Task Force. Where's the academic team task force? I'm not sure. I'm not sure what you're the academic team. I, I, oh, oh, I'm sorry. I, um, it was athletic. It was athletic. Yeah. So, we work pretty closely with with athletics. Obviously, you know, through through uh, student life, they're a part of um, you know they're a part of what we do. We we work really closely with Dean McElroy, Dr. McElroy, who's the athletic director. Work closely with uh, their coaches. Um, we we've done a number of things. There, no, there is no. Currently, no task force. What I will say is, when we have, have addressed specific issues within athletics, we've actually been able to measure a clear response in a positive way. So, if you look back at some of the statistics that we've we've demonstrated over the last few years about things like alcohol, sexual assault, other issues as it relates to athletics, we've actually seen a significant decrease in those areas uh, or in those uh, types of, of incidents in athletics or related to athletics. So, um, so no, there is no there is no task force, but there is good work being done that's netting a result. The other thing is I would say, I think on any other given day, probably everybody in this room, if not close to everybody in this room, would argue with somebody that said that we should be compared to some other organization. We have benefits as Greeks that other organizations don't have. We have resources, we have properties for many of those organizations. We have the ability to ha host parties with alcohol for many years where most other organizations don't have those privileges. There's a lot that Greek life has. The other part of this is we don't come and go. Um, many of you have probably belonged to other student organizations for short periods of time. You've, you've showed up, you had a good time, and then you kind of moved on. You know, we join for life, right? Unless they kick us out. It's the truth. Um, we join for life. We're, we're not the same thing as every other student organization. Yes, there are sometimes higher standards expected of us. At the same time, please make no mistake, there are high standards applied to every student organization, every student at any school. So no, we don't have a task force for every type of student organization. But we do have one for Greek life. And I, I wish that I could convey to you in a way that you would believe it's because we want to make sure Greek life stays here. You guys always talk about how you guys care about the safety and students here. You guys created the bias acceptance response team, um, but yet most of the people here, and I'm sure with the non Greeks as well, are in fear of using the Good Samaritan policy and would almost let somebody die rather than helping them out and taking them to the hospital. And I think that's something that should be addressed crucially and one of the most important things that needs to be addressed at this school. Um, so 
So this is a good follow-up to your question preceding this one. So as a member of both the Greek and Athletic Committee here at RPI, um, my question is why have there been no actions to fix the problems that your own statistics show exist in the athletic community to the same extent as the Greek community? Because um, it appears that there's a disconnect with the administration between how they monitor and protect the well-being of Greek and student athletes. And that's frankly insulting as a member of both communities. And you also claim that there's been differences um, in how they've been trained. And as an upperclassman member of the Truman Diocesan here, there have been no differences since freshman year in the trainings that you have to go through each year to prevent the sort of sexual assault, alcohol instances. So frankly, I don't see the differences that you're claiming to make in athletics either. So. <laughs> Have you had any trainings as a member of the swim and dive team? I've had multiple, yes. Not as much as I've had for Greek life. Okay. But you've had multiple. Yes. And, and, and so, but to my knowledge, I don't know that there's been a whole lot of issues with the swim and dive team. No, but other teams that I'm very familiar with, there have been many issues. And as a general, you said that there have been differences made in the past years in how athletic teams are treated, trained, to deal with these instances. And I have not, as a member of the community, seen these implemented and how they impact students. So, From your perspective as a swim and dive member, correct? And, and just a member of the athletic community as yeah. a whole, where I'm very good friends with members of the athletic community at large, I have not seen a difference in how these teams are treated. OK. Well, so I appreciate like, that input. Why, like, why? Like, why well, is Greek life being cleaned out? Here's what I can tell you. I, I, I don't know what you see, right? I can't tell you why you don't see it. What I can tell you is that there is a very long list of the things that we are doing, including things like educating coaches, having very specific expectations of our coaches and how they, they go about educating our students, the messages they send, the way that they hold them responsible and accountable, not only in the sport, but what they're doing outside of practice and outside of, of competition. And so you know, I, I appreciate that input. I'll certainly continue to work with, with my colleagues in athletics, but. When I look at what has been invested and then what also has been the outcome, there have been differences. So I'm sorry you're not seeing that. Yeah. It, I, I just feel like there's a, I feel like there's a double standard with two groups. Currently. I'd love to talk to you more about exactly where you see the double standard because okay. from where we stand, there shouldn't be. So I'd love to hear more. We're going to take you up on that, but I do want to point out a couple things. When I was vice president, I had to sign off on the uh, athletic compliance documents for the NCAA. And what I can tell you is that what I saw on my desk, on a per capita basis, athletics does a lot more training, uh, has a lot more accountability conversations, and actually supports its student athletes around these issues in ways that we don't see in other areas of campus. Fast forward to the Greek Life Task Force. We took that information under consideration and some of the recommendations that we have embedded in uh, the task force report pick up on some of the good aspects that we've seen from athletics, particularly the radical decline in the kinds of alcohol and Title IX uh, incidents that are resulting from that particular cohort. If that's the case, why weren't athletes included in the Greek Life Task Force? Because in the task force report, there were statistics that show athletics still, to this day, have issues almost on the same exact level as the statistics that Greek life show. So if they have been greatly reduced, why aren't they included in this effort with Greek life to further reduce them if they're on the same I'm sorry, what, what specifically are you asking? In, in the task force report, there were alcohol incidences statistics that show that athletics has almost the same exact level as Greek life for alcohol instances. That's not what the data that I have uh, show, but I will look hard at that. It was in one of the appendices to the Greek life task force report. 
I will find it if you play it. <laughs> please, please. So I, I think we might clear this up, but I'm so sorry. Let me know if I'm like, if you need me to sit down a bit. Um, are you referring to not instances, but statistics uh, from some of like the health surveys that show that athletes maybe drink as much as drinks? Is that what you're talking about? There was some survey about alcohol use given in the sports. Okay, so it wasn't instances, so like judicial fences. Uh, I think that's where we're, we're taking. So yeah, there, you know, it, especially on a national level, there's absolutely kind of this, this uh, what shows up in terms of use of alcohol, things like other, other issues of hazing, sexual assault, that definitely shows up kind of par and par. And, but we have seen a reduction on this campus in particular. So I gave you my card, and I'd love to continue to talk to you about, about what we've seen. So are you saying that there's no correlation between alcohol use and alcohol instances, or are you just saying that free are more predisposition to have instances that require medical attention or something like that? No, I'm just, I, I'm, I'm simply, no, please don't put words in my mouth. What I'm saying is what, it, what shows up in the judicial process, what shows up in reports, that, that I would consider an instance where we have said Greek alcohol violation or athletic alcohol violation in our system yeah, Greeks show up more. We are monitoring Greeks more often. You're absolutely right. Yeah, so then would you say that the athletic and non-athletic campus and Greek communities, since they have the same alcohol consumption statistics, would they have more judicial cases then? And then would this be a concern for the administration because right now it doesn't appear to be just because they're off campus? Thank you. Thank you. With regards to the double standard that was mentioned earlier, first, is my understanding that under the recommendations, any sort of event that could be associated with a fraternity containing several fraternity members and alcohol would be considered a social event with alcohol. Is this correct? Yep. Do you say that one more time? Uh, so is my understanding that the definition of social event with alcohol under the Greek Life Task Force that is not allowed is any event that could be reasonably tied to a fraternity involving multiple fraternity members and alcohol. Does that sound about accurate? Not necessarily at yeah. a chapter's house, but say if, I don't know, five people living in an apartment were all a member of the same fraternity and consumed alcohol, that would be considered a social event with alcohol. So under the Greek life, not as simple as that. So if, if you happen to have four people li living together in an apartment who are members of an organization and they're of age and they're drinking, no, I'm not going to consider that a violation of, of the current policy. That's the rule. As he says is yeah. in the handbook, that, that is the definition. So the, so the rule is, you think the rule is that just four guys who happen to be a member of a fraternity living in an apartment off campus, can't have alcohol in their apartment and can't drink together if they're of age. That's how it's written. That's, how it's written. that's, not, that's not how it's written. And it it's so let me. Also, the Office of Greek Life Commons has so told us that that is. Excuse me. Let me, let me, hold on. I, I think the question is when does it become just a bunch of guys hanging out and when does it become a fraternity event even if it is in an off campus house? Yeah, so there's, so that's the reason why we, that's the reason why there's an investigation and we look at the details. Right? We want to know, is this actually a party? Is this a social event? Or is this just some people who happen to be members of an organization who do live together and are drinking in their apartment privately? Okay? There is a difference there. We've not held anybody accountable for what you th you're saying is the policy. We've held some chapters accountable for what they've done in their houses and also what they've done in some privately owned uh, apartments where they've invited people over who were all associated or affiliated or about to be affiliated with that fraternity and gave them alcohol. 
that makes much more sense then, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Again, I think I think you I think you do understand. Again, suppose that instead of being members of a fraternity, we were all members of say the basketball team. If we were to then invite other members of the basketball team over, then I don't really think that it would be looked into the same way as it would if it was, say, a fraternity doing the same thing. I will look for the hand up section and get back to you with that. I'm also in the process of looking for the handbook section on that definition, so I will get back to you once I find that. verify this, and then if I see more problems, I will return. Uh, secondly, uh, with, <laughs> yep. so with regard to finances, one of the stated goals is promoting financial stability. However, looking at my chapter's current finances, approximately two-thirds of people living in-house at the moment are sophomores, and if recruitment is deferred, as you suggest, then that would mean that they are not able to become brothers until late in the spring semester which would be after the point that housing has already been set for the spring semester. So that would mean that they are effectively not able to live in the Greek housing because one of the requirements of the form is are currently a member of Greek life. should also consider recruiting sophomores in the fall. There are, there are about um, almost 80% of, of the sophomore class who are not members of the Greek system. I just have a quick... I wonder why. Uh, I just have a quick point of clarification for uh, Dean Aspar. So earlier, uh, like seven questions ago, you said that the recommendations of the Greek Life Task Force did not go far enough. And I was just wondering from your perspective, what would be going far enough? It's, it's a look at the general statement. And I think we have a lot of work to do. It's a general statement though. I think we have a lot of work to do on, on a number of fronts and that not one of these recommendations will solve a problem in and of itself, right? So, so that's what I mean. So you don't have any specific examples? Yeah, I think we have to do a lot more about things like sexual assault prevention. And not we, we, all of us, I think we all have work to do to make sure that when we're hosting events, whether there's alcohol or not, that they're actually safe. And not that we think they're safe, but we've made sure they're safe. I think that we have a lot to do around things like taking care of one another in terms of mental health issues. I think that there's a lot that we can do to learn about how we can best recognize that things are happening with our brothers or sisters, know how to intervene, and where to refer them to to get help. I think that there's a lot that we can do beyond those recommendations, and those are a couple of examples. Is that helpful? Hey everybody, so uh, I want you guys to, first of all, just wanna paint a little picture in your head. On December 19th, now wait, can one of you guys tell me when December 19th is roughly in the semester, what goes on at the end of December? Finals. 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 So during that time, my fraternity, Pi Cap Alpha, was placed on emergency suspension and we lost our new member class. Two days later, uh, we get an email to the community saying that Pi Cap Alpha is placed on emergency suspension due to alcohol violation. So we receive an email saying that we're on suspension and then an email goes out to the community two days later saying that, hey, guess what? This fraternity violated alcohol policy. We had to wait till the next semester, January 28th, for our appeal hearing. hearing. Three days later, January 31st, we were found innocent on all 
you know, not guilty, not responsible, and all those charges. Yeah. On February 5th, there was a forum with Greek leaders. I spoke to some of you who were there saying, hey, it took you guys two days to announce to the community that we're guilty for stuff. We were just found innocent of it. When are you gonna tell everyone that we're innocent? And you spoke to me specifically and said, we'll get this ironed out. To this day, it's now been seven weeks. No communication has been sent out to the community, our chapter, or all new members, our alumni, or our national headquarters. And if you go on the Greek Life Task Force website, we're still listed as being under emergency suspension. Now I feel that it's very important that we work with you to get all this Greek Life Task Force stuff sorted out effectively. But the one request I really had towards you guys is to clear our name for something that we are wrongly accused of and that's yet to happen. So I'm wondering when will that actually happen? Because it took two days to say we messed up and then we didn't actually mess up. And now it's been seven weeks and we've heard nothing. Just kidding. <laughs> um, so first, uh, I think what I heard you say was that your national group and nobody was notified that you were cleared, and I don't think that's that's accurate. But I, I will tomorrow work with the folks who control the website to make sure that that's corrected. Okay. And can you send out an email to the community as well? It seems like it's only fair. Probably, but, uh, but we have to. Uh, But I think that there are ways that we need to make sure that we are clear about those decisions, including yours. Okay. Yeah. Do you want to? Let's let's be clear. When when there are when there's credible evidence that's brought to the judicial process, we go through that process. There's a reason that there are appeals and there are appeals boards. Please don't think that the Greek Judicial Board found them not responsible because it was the Greek Judicial Board. The Greek Judicial Board found them not responsible because they did a great job, and that's why we have those appeals levels. Yes, we admit that there, was, there were uh, issues with the way that the original decision was made, and that's why it was overturned. Does that satisfy? Yeah. And then I just have a follow-up question, if you guys don't mind me going again real quick. Sure. Yeah, so um, am I, from what I understand, that you, you've worked on a Greek-like task force before, is that correct? Where did you work on that Greek Life Task Force? George Washington. George Washington, okay. Uh, how long has, did that process take for the Greek Life Task Force? I mean, it's going back a couple of years. I would say it probably took um, seven or eight months, probably about the same amount of time. Seven, eight months for the beginning of Greek Life Task Force to everything being done. No, like this, it's a process that the task force recommendations are going to go in, and then we're going to start implementation. I think that's a multi, it's a multi-year process that will have multiple phases and multiple working committees. That's what we've been talking about with the um, IFC and Panhellenic leadership. So th this is not, this does not start the day the task force recommendations go to the president. It's the beginning. So no, I, we, I, and I, that will continue well into the future. No, but my question is, since the Greek Life Task Force was formed. How long did it take for you guys, for the Greek Life Task Force, to feel that they were no longer needed and that the culture shift happened and everything is how it should be? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, if you ask administrators there, if you ask our Greek, we have the equivalent of Greek team, they would say they are still working on it. They are still tracking some of those same milestones, you know, 18 months, 36, 24, 36 months out. Um, and I think we will expect to do the same. We will be setting one year, two year, three year goals because we're talking right now about recruitment, that's a two or three year process to get everybody up to the, um, the level we wanted to be. And I, and I just want to uh, make a point. We didn't all clap when we heard about 5% increase in the sorority recruitment. But, and I don't think we've been explicit about this tonight, but we would love to see growth in the Greek community. That means quality, numbers, chapters, multicultural chapters, sororities. So I think that's a commitment that we are, Travis mentioned before resources. We've committed more personnel resources. That means we also want to see growth. We're not doing this because we want to see a smaller, struggling community. We want to be better together, which means bigger and better, right? It means stronger. It doesn't mean weaker. So our goal, you have that as a commitment. 
That is a commitment from the president, the vice president, the dean of students, and all the administration, and all of our alumni. You have people who are on, you know, they are committed to this. So I think it's a process. I agree, but I'm just asking for a straight up time period, like years, months, from the formation of Greek Life Task Force to when your recommendations were implemented at the other school you worked at, how many years, months did that take? Because when I asked you that question at the yeah. Greek Leadership Summit, you said six, seven years, and it's still going on. It is still going on. It hasn't been six or seven years, but okay. it has been going on for several years. Several years. Yeah. So you expect that same thing to happen yeah. at RPI, yeah. that I this expect, will go on for several years? I expect this years. is a long-term commitment. We've been around 165 years. If we want to be bigger and better and stronger, if we want to reach, reach excellence, we're not going to reach, you know, reach excellence next year. We're not going to reach it in the fall. We have to be equally committed, and that's why I asked the question about how many of you are proud to be or connected to be RPI. We want you to be back in here a year, two, three, five, 25, 40, 50 years from now saying, I'm giving back to my community. I want to open doors with Arch. I want to open career opportunities. I want to advise students. I want to mentor. I want to give. So. Uh, that, I guess, somewhat answered my question. Thank you. Uh, um, I just want to remind everyone that like the purpose of this open forum was for people to ask questions to um, IFC and Cran Hill, not the <laughs> administration. Um, we invited them here so that they could see, um, would just listen to the concerns that um, our community was having. So if you have any questions for us, I was prepping myself to be able to talk to you people. So <laughs> I'd like a question. <laughs> Again, you know, uh, we, we do have our administrators here, and, and they will answer questions, but like, we're also here too. So if you have any questions for us, we'll do our best as well to, to answer those questions too. All right, I'm gonna jump back to um, the summer arch. So this also pertains to non-Greek students, because I've heard this story many times. Um, so my understanding, the whole point of summer arch is to get your classes sooner so you could get a co-op uh, in the semester you take off, right? Okay, so I've heard many stories of sophomores being offered co-ops and internships and having to decline because they couldn't get out of the summer arch semester. And I, first of all, I think that's a huge problem that the point of summer arch is to get internships and they're getting them and they can't take it because of summer arch. It's very counterintuitive. But also um, when a good friend of mine tried to uh, appeal the uh, summer arch semester for financial reasons, he claims that him and his family need to work and save in the summer in order to pay the big back-to-back -back, um, tuition charges in the fall and the spring. RPI said that if he takes a financial leave of absence, he'll have to register absolute last in the fall, even after incoming freshman as a junior. So I just keep on hearing that RPI is looking out for its students' best interests, um, but that's not what I'm experiencing. I just want everybody else to know that. Thank you. So, from 
what we've seen, uh, as you've seen with the mitigating uh, high risk behaviors um, section, so section four, um, moving to third party vendors um, is the recommendation that, that has been put on. Um, now, again, for a clarification, now with third party vendors, is that including, is that off, off site for uh, our fraternities or could they bring in third party vendors to their houses and use them in our houses? Oh. I was also going to say, within our own executive board, we promoted um, student peer monitoring for registered social events, which is the most effective way to obtain representation of the general body, be it to be ISD-related, analytic-related, or non-group-affiliated. Um, so the responsibility would be to attend registered social events and just make sure everything is somewhat in line. Unfortunately, we haven't had the opportunity to really test the student peer monitoring program because we have no social events. If I understand your question, it's the on-campus versus off-campus. Right. Okay. Uh, the main uh, part of the new alcohol policy <laughs> is that there can't be alcohol in the houses. We have seven facilities on campus uh, where we do have licenses or our contractor does that would be permissible for alcohol service. the community on how many Greek houses are either suspended or removed uh, and if any of those were related to the current changes that the task force has implemented this year? Could you repeat that explicitly? What are the two Greek chapters that were suspended during the task force period? Or? Uh, a total number that are suspended and uh, removed and I guess if any of them were related to the current changes made by the Greek Life Task Force. So last semester, um, while I was at EVP, uh, we did have three chapters that were suspended in the last semester. Um, so um, that was due to infractions uh, via the task force. Um, but no, I don't have a total or. All right, so mental health, substance abuse, sexual assault, these are all issues which are issues with Greek life and we're of court on that. But I've definitely gotten the strong impression from numerous conversations with the administration that it, of putting kind of the onus of responsibility on students. You yourself, Afgar, mentioned like, hey, you should recognize signs of mental health crisis in your community, learn to support, all, all fine. Um, but this matters, because I am my chapter's mental health chair and there are no resources. We can, I, somebody was in crisis recently and I could do nothing for them. I had to, like, because there was not, there was a heavy waiting list on mental health services. And so I'm asking for these issues of sexual assault, mental health and substance abuse, what new resources are being put on the end of, of improving student experience? Not just asking the students to prevent these things from happening, but what new things are being put into place to help fix these problems when they occur? because there's a severe shortage in reporting for in resources going off campus because of that aforementioned deeper pockets policy you guys have. I honestly do not know where I can go to give people resources in my Greek, in my Greek house to actually help these problems. And I don't know if there's going to be a day when these things actually, resources are actually on campus. Uh, two things, one. One, we had several vacancies in uh, the clinical mental health area. We have new staff who started February 1st. I believe there's one more, a new position uh, in the process. A key change though in how mental health operates is that we are installing a triage uh, program there so that there is a therapist who will be available to do immediate assessment 
and care with patients same day. So we're moving forward with that process. We know it's not perfect, not as good as we'd like it to be, but we are very actively assessing everything and trying to determine how through the triage process we can identify those teachers who are in immediate crisis, who need a different kind of therapy versus those who can be handled at the triage desk again, same day. All right, so I am, I hosted a summit on these topics. I have spent the past several weeks trying to collect stories on this and it's, part of the issue is I don't wanna step on anyone's privacy, but there were really severe issues in terms of how certain things were handled, especially in the case of sexual assault by the administration. What is the degree of oversight that's happening there? Where can, we, where can people go if they say, have a complaint with a counselor who maybe said some very unfortunate things to them, or if they had a complaint with how their Title IX case was going? Where, can there be new pathways of which like, students can have, serve to have these grievances addressed? Yeah, there are two existing. The first is the Dean of Students Office uh, that has uh, a process for students bringing confidential concerns immediately. Travis, you wanna identify that site? So if you just go to doso.rpi.edu, you can find uh, the student complaint form or, or it's a report and incident form. Those are confidential. What I mean by that is it's, you know, obviously you don't have to put your information if you want to be anonymous, but if you do put your information so we can reach out, have a conversation and better understand what's going on and actually provide resources that will be kept confidential. If it's a complaint about a staff member uh, or faculty or any employee at the university, I would encourage you to reach out to Human Resources. On their webpage, they do have a, a form to be able to complain, to uh, file any kind of a complaint or concern and they would follow up in terms of with those employees. All right, thank you. Yeah. Uh, you well, let me just mention also that um, there's a, there's a dean on duty rotation that, that operates on our campus 24-7, 365. So any day, any time of the day, that anybody is in need of, of help, support, intervention, uh, you can always contact public safety, ask for the dean on duty, and they will, they will contact them. Those folks will reach out, intervene, provide support services for you in that moment. Okay, um, I know, that I'm pretty sure that PubSafe, because this came up in the incident where somebody was having a mental health crisis, I don't think that PubSafe was informed that like that was a pathway that I could be told about, because we were just, I asked like, is there another option I can do besides having a police officer show up to this potentially fraught situation? And they were like, no. If you could follow up with Dean Apgar and give him the specifics on that, I'd appreciate it. Mm -hmm. How many of you know what a class dean is? Thought you didn't know about class. Uh, but that's another resource for you. Anytime you or a friend is in trouble or you think that somebody's having a trouble, our class deans are all over it and they know how to expedite the process. I just wanna uh, inform everyone again, uh, we do have this room until 10 o'clock. Uh, so we'd love to hear all your concerns. So just keep that in mind that we do technically have a time limit. Um, can I ask two really quick questions? Sure. Okay. So the first one is just so like everyone has general knowledge but about it, but what is the metric for what is considered a Greek sexual assault related incident? Does anyone know? for what is considered a Greek-related sexual assault incident? So the, the Title IX folks have explained to me that essentially um, anything that happened in a house, or a Greek house, anything that happened uh, related to a Greek event, either at the event or uh, kind of began at the event and may have gone somewhere else. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so then my second question just is, so we've had like lots of discussions in our own chapters about um, the deferred recruitment and how it seemed kind of negative, or at least it, that's what it seemed to be to us. Um, but I'm sure that I'm hoping that this decision was made with like positive um, outcomes in mind. So what are those positive outcomes and can someone please explain them to me? So there are pros and cons of deferred recruitment. One of um, the bigger pros of deferred is that freshmen can get acquainted to campus getting thrown into their freshman year. Um, 
without any experience with college or Greek life or anything like that can be overwhelming. So it gives them time to get adjusted to it. Um, in the second semester, they'll have an, um, an actual GPA as opposed to just having a high school GPA to see if college is for them. And another big thing is that it gives them time to get um, more of a greater image of Greek life. Right now, it's kind of, you're thrown into it right away. Uh, but with the deferred recruitment plan that we, that we wrote up, uh, they would have a lot of time during the first semester to see as many houses as they would like. So it's not just, um, so it's not just like they see one or two houses and have to make a decision at the end of the day. They, ha they have the option to see as many houses as possible. Thank you, but thank you for this account there. I joined that first semester freshman year and I am a second semester senior right now. And if I didn't join first semester, I would not be here. And So my first question is for administration. Uh, so Dean Apgar, you stated earlier that every student, Greek life or non-Greek life, should be held to a higher standard and be treated equally. Uh, however, I, there was a tweet about a month ago. I'm sure some people in here have read this, and it says, I was raped at RPI by a student. RPI is punishing him by suspending him for six months. Six months for raping me. After that, he gets to return to school and graduate. Now my question to you is, how is that an acceptable punishment, and how is that holding to, how is that holding students to a high standard? These are always the hardest kinds of conversations, and um, and mostly because you know, look, I don't know who tweeted that. Mm -hmm. I have no idea if what they're saying is accurate. I have to believe that maybe it is, but I don't know the details, and I couldn't talk about those details publicly. Um, our Title IX process. It is, I think, thorough. Uh, there are multiple levels of, of decision making, uh, not just from those folks at Title IX, but actually the Vice President of Student Life has, uh, has you know, various appeals. And, uh, and so you know, that, that's a really hard thing for me to respond to. I, I, I appreciate the question. Um, I, I don't know that I can adequately actually respond because I don't know the details of that situation. Or even if I did, I couldn't talk about it. But be, to be clear, yeah, we all have to be held to, to a, a high standard, right? Um, organizationally, what I was saying a moment ago, every single one of our organizations is based on and built on a set of values. And if we were to kind of take all of those, in fact, in the report, I think we have listed every chapter's values. There's a lot of commonalities. There's not one that talks about things like harming anybody else. They're all really honorable and, and, um, and the kinds of things that we should all strive to incorporate in our own personal lives. Integrity, academics, that's why you're here, right? Um, brotherhood and sisterhood. We all want to make sure that that's what we're striving for, that these organizations represent that before anything else. That's what we're trying to get to. And, and I do appreciate that we're not necessarily gonna agree on that path. But we sincerely are trying to achieve exactly that. And so to do that, we have to hold, not just organizations, but individuals. And we collectively have to hold one another accountable. <coughs> That's why I'm sitting here. I wanna hear what you have to say, okay? Okay, thank you. And my next question, if you don't mind, is for administration and IFC, uh, after tonight, I would like to know if you can answer this accurately. What is your next plan of action? Because I believe the concerns that have been voiced tonight have been consistently voiced since the Greek Life Task Force has begun. It has been, it's been very clear that the students, the alumni are very against the idea, but it doesn't seem like our concerns have much, have much uh, weight, thank you. I <laughs> uh, have much weight on the decisions that are being made. So. 
what is your, how are you two going to work together to ensure to us that our concerns are actually being taken into account? So, thank you. In regards to what IFC and Penn and Hull will be doing after this, um, again, we have our two, uh, our secretary and our, our VPIA, uh, taking notes at the moment. Uh, the reason is because we're taking notes of everything you guys have said. Later on, we're planning to sit down as boards and go through everything and start to figure out what are the most important issues that we need to start focusing on. So it, it's, you know, from what I've seen, it's recruitment. So we're gonna sit down and start actually planning out what, what can we do with recruitment? And we're gonna plan out, we're gonna talk with the administration too and say, okay, recruitment's our issue. Where do we go from here? I'm t like, I will tell you all blatantly right now, we will do, like, it's our jobs right now to represent you guys. And we will do nothing else but do that. So if there's something you guys want us specifically to do, let us know. Um, I guess our, our emails are on the website. So if you wanna do that, contact us. If you have any thoughts for us exactly what to do, let us know. Um, we're kind of in this brainstorming phase and that's like, we have never had the opportunity to sit down and listen to every single one of you. And that's why we, we plan this thing is we want to hear your concerns and figure out what to do from here. So that was the other, that was the other question I posed for you guys is what do you guys want us to do as well? So if there's anything else, uh, let us know and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll dive in and look into it. Thank you. I, I defer to uh, someone in Merritt's office, but um, you know, to anyone here from our office at the moment, if you have, can you elaborate on that? Um, I mean, you all, you all are students here, right? Yeah. I think that the point is, you shouldn't be doing things as Pi Kappa Phi. Yeah. Right. Um, you should be, do, uh, but nobody's going to stop you from gathering as a group of, of people and, and doing philanthropic activities. And if, if they're trying to, pl please give me a call. Uh, yeah. We'd love you as RPI students to continue to do those things. How you, how you continue, you, you know, your scholarship, uh, yeah, I don't know if I have the answer for you right now. I think we, I'd have to have more information. But those other things that you're talking about, you know, we're, we're not going to stop a group of RPI students from gathering and doing good things. Okay. So the implication. As a group of RPI students, I would encourage you to have study sessions, right. and RPI writing sessions, or excuse me, resume writing sessions. Uh, so the so just a quick comment off of that. So the only thing that's stopping, or the the only thing that's stopping them from collectively meeting is a set of letters. Is that what I'm getting? Um, according to the student handbook, if I'm a student that is 21 years or older, I can drink on campus in the student union. More importantly, I can drink in the privacy of my room or residence hall. If Greek housing is considered residence buildings under the Greek Life Commons Agreement, which are subject to the same inspections that you claim is the school helping Greek life, why can I not drink in the room in my own house?
So it was a policy that was developed and, and, and put out as a result of the, the beginning of the Greek Life Task Force, you know, putting a pause on social activities with alcohol, removing alcohol from houses as we work through this process. So why is that not also appropriated with? <laughs> walk off the <laughs> why is that not That's appropriated why, with me. Um, all of campus? If, I'm sorry? Why is that not incorporated with all of campus? Why is that not incorporated? I mean, are you? This is a very specific process with Greek life. And we've explained that many times over. Mm -hmm. I understand you disagree with it, but that's the answer. Yeah. So where we're moving with alcohol and other drug policy is likely that uh, there will be no alcohol in any of our residence halls in the future. Okay, please bear with me. Uh, my name is Bree, I'm a junior, and I'm a sister at Alpha Phi, and I was the director of philanthropy for Penhill last year. I'm also the second Panhellenic woman on the task force or part of this discussion panel, that is relevant. Um, during the panel discussions last semester, we covered a plethora of topics, but one in particular that I wanted to bring up, mental health. Many points regarding Greek life have been made around the issue of alcohol and substance abuse. This fundamental <laughs> issue, people have found, has become a strong route to build cases about sexual assault and instances of students being put in danger in other ways. It has also been discussed that students become less motivated and successful if they consume alcohol or use substances in unsafe manners. I personally do not support the idea that Greek life promotes unsafe alcohol consumption or substance abuse, and in my life and my college experience thus far, the students that most impress me every day with their involvement and motivation and how far they can push the very definition of success are Greek. And so backtracking just a little, college students do drink, but very few people take a step back and really examine the reasons why. Currently, the assumption is that both Greek and non-Greek students drink because Greek life fosters an environment that promotes that sort of lifestyle. However, at the discussion panel meetings, we discussed at length mental health. Are students more driven to drink because the, envi because the environment at RPI, not in Greek life, breeds extremely high levels of stress, anxiety, and depression? house to deal with all of these issues because of impressive wash care systems and supportive mentalities. I'm also the president of the Mental Health Awareness Club on campus called Active Minds, and we have talked a lot about the environment surrounding mental health at RPI. I have two questions. My first question to IFC Panhill and the administration is the following. What have you done to investigate the reasons behind alcohol and substance abuse on campus and the correlation to the very stressful environment we study in? Were you going to say something? No, no, no. Oh. I was going to say. You know, <laughs> I, I, I was going to say. I like. I, I really don't have an answer from from IFC's end um, in terms of, you know, looking into mental health and um, regarding that. You know, it's we have promoted that the fact that Greek life has provided the support networks to get through the stressful life that is college at RPI. So um, we've looked in that and we support that and. You know, that's one thing that we will also want to take as an initiative is, you know, how do we help you guys as councils to, you know, aid with mental health? Mm -hmm. um, so, so that's one end. And we also need the feedback through that because, you know, as a board, a lot of other things we take care of, but we also need the input from you as <laughs> members to do that. Yeah, so, so let me just state, um, I was having a conversation with Dr. Lawrence, who's our medical director, the other day, and he was making me aware of, you know, look, what is, what you're describing as, Increased levels of anxiety, increased levels of depression amongst college students at RPI is absolutely not unique to RPI. You know, a decade ago, so just 10 years ago, and I realize a decade sounds like a really long time for you, but just 10 years ago, which is not that long of a, time, a period of time, uh, about a third of college students in this country probably sought out some sort of mental health uh, services. Today, it's, it's about um, you know, kind of almost, uh, what was it? Seven out of 10 is, is what Dr. Lawrence was explaining to us. I mean, there's this, this massive increase in students seeking out the service, which on one hand is fantastic that we've maybe uh, sort of broken away from the stigmas associated with seeking help for mental health uh, needs. But on the other hand, we also then have this drastic increase. And some of it, yeah, the causation, uh, 
a lot of things. And yes, this is an incredibly difficult academic institution. Um, people do turn to things like self-medication for, uh, for some of those issues. So there's no question. We've worked with our health center, we've worked with our counseling center to better understand that. So that's, that's part of what we're doing here. And that's part of why we're trying to identify more resources for our health center as well as our counseling center. We're also trying to look at what are some unique things we might do in terms of staffing elsewhere. You know, how do we uh, infuse student life with pr possibly more um, social workers? You know, pe people who could do some of that, that work outside of the counseling center uh, itself. Okay, thank you. Um, my second question is, has there been any research done into the benefit of Greek life on first semester freshmen and how the support of Greek house can make the transition into college much easier? Um, has there been any research done into the benefit of Greek life on first semester freshmen and how the support system of a Greek house can make the transition into college a lot easier? Uh, that's a good question for you. I, I don't, I'm not aware of specific first semester freshman research. There's certainly research that demonstrates that Greek life provides that support of, of benefit, right? And that, um, you know, on this campus, it also rings true that most folks who join um, a fraternity or sorority on our campus, there's a, a slightly higher rate of persistence to graduation, meaning that people aren't leaving, they are staying. Um, and, and that for the most part, you all are doing well academically. Uh, I talk all the time, I think I said it earlier tonight, uh, I think it's the greatest strength of Greek life is that support network, the family away from family. I'm sorry, just one follow-up question, I'm sorry. Um, I guess now that you've said the statistics of Tucsonian Mental Health went from 3 out of 10 to 7 out of 10, um, right, in the past 10 years. Yeah, and, and please don't quote me. I, I, I know that it was a, a drastic increase, and I just may not be remembering the data okay. correctly. But approximately. But if the situation surrounding mental health has gotten almost twice...
I had a meeting with Meredith yesterday, and I brought it up, you know, being a member of uh, CF. <laughs> 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 uh, and, and I asked Meredith, uh, you know, to kindly take us off. Uh, apparently, she has lost access to the web page itself. <laughs> Very cool. <laughs> so, when that gets resolved, we will be taken off. So, so the web page is undergoing a lot of transition right now, but we, we will address that specific page to make sure it reflects accurate data. So I guess this question, because we keep beating around the same points and people keep coming up with the same points. Hey, everyone in the room, stand up if you joined as a freshman, if you wouldn't mind. Cool. Now sit down if you join second semester freshman and you and keep standing if you were a first semester freshman. Yeah, I could have worded that better. Oh well. Yeah. So like a number of things, but like we keep tell we keep there is all of the data that we keep telling you, everything we keep saying is yeah, a lot of things need to get improved. We don't disagree with that. There's a lot of problems with alcohol abuse, sexual misconduct, everything else gets listed. But we all firmly agree, I think I can say it better than that, that we do not want deferred rush or recruitment or whatever, and the arch housing be nice, especially given that we need to meet certain regulations. Again, I quote, it is agreed that all students may reside in fraternities who are in housing except those who are stressed from students unless otherwise permitted by our policies. Um, I really should have had a point when I came up here, but, but I guess my point is it doesn't appear that you're listening to the one main point we have. So to be overly blunt, why should we listen to these recommendations? Hi, um, with my fraternity, this past rush, we had a lot of rushies who were choosing between Greek life at all. That's often a t trend we saw with our house was it was either people who were picking deeps for Greek life or just not going to be in Greek life at all. And when these uh, rushies talked to their parents, their parents looked online, looked up RPI Greek life, they saw that there was A, an active Greek life task force investigating, not investigating, but looking to improve the culture of RPI Greek life, which shows that there's something wrong with RPI Greek life culture as a whole. And I'm not sure about, oh, well, I'm pretty sure all of us can agree that RPI Greek life culture is vastly different than most Greek life culture at other schools. <laughs> um, my main question is, what can the administration and the IFC do to help assuage the fear of some of these parents when they look up RPI Greek life and they are concerned that their students are be wasting their time, they'll be putting their students in dangerous situations and stuff like that. Yes, Jordan. All right, yeah, to, to kick it off, a couple ideas that IFC was kick, kicking around and wanted to implement into this upcoming semester is really kind of not just trying to recruit the students, but also recruit the parents. So that includes during ESO, accepted students day. We plan on doing a lot of like open sessions, trying to get to as many parents as possible to get them to understand what Greek life at RPI really is about, and it's not just what they see in the movies. Um, that was one of the bigger things. Uh, we kind of wanted to start a social media campaign similar to, um, I'm not really sure what it was, would be similar to, but <laughs> um, a social media campaign to improve the image of Greek life here at RPI, try to reach as many facets as possible. But those are just a couple ideas that we had from the IFC standpoint. Also, just follow up, on the Greek Life Task Force website, there's a nice current block on the bottom that says current news, which is news related to not RPI Greek Life. It's just a bunch of news articles reported to Greek Life as a whole. And most of them are bad, because Greek Life isn't doing very good. So when parents look up the Greek Life Task Force and they see that there's a bunch of reports, there is inside the wild wor world of an American fraternity, uh, Wiley College orders Greek Life to cease after hazing incident. Moslem University suspends all fraternities and sororities indefinitely. 
Um, former attorney member suspended for assault. It's not the best look of RPI Greek life, especially because I, I have friends who are in Greek life at WVU and other schools. They have a much different Greek life experience than I would have. I would not have survived that. But I don't feel like that current news page needs should be there if it's not related to RPI Greek life. That's just a suggestion for me. I don't really want it. I also want to add to that. So uh, when we met with the AIGC, both Panhel and IFC majorly said, what's one issue that we have in Greek life as a whole? And it's our image. Um, so for us to say to you as Greek life task force, we've done a lot of suggestions and we'd like to see more, I think I'm speaking for all of us and even the whole community. When you put out those kind of reports, kind of praise us for the good things that we've done and give more ideas like this is what they've done. Here's some of the chapters, here are their successes and speak more on that. I think as a whole, it'll make us look better and I feel like we'd be more inclined to accept these changes. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more. Vish, what am I about to say? So I have stood in front of, of uh, a number of, of, of groups, IFC, uh, chapter leaders, and I keep asking for you, give us your good news, please. When, when we have received a few things, I, we, we have put it through our process, social media, student life page, you know, all of those things. Uh, we're happy to do it. We want to do more of it. But, but we need you to tell us because we don't always know. Isn't that the point of five star? Sorry? Isn't that not the point of the five star philanthropy thing we have to submit every two years? Yeah, that's not the point of it, but that's a great place for us to get some information, sure. But things like, you know, in, in the moment, you know, those are end of the year assessments, and I'm not arguing that. That's a place we can glean information like that. You're right. But we'd love to know if one of your members had just been received an award. You know, I happen to be really close friends with some folks who are you know, associated with SIG, you know, SIG F. So I know that Vish got an award recently and went out of our way. <laughs> yeah, go Vish. No. Uh, but went out of our way to make sure that, you know, I, I you know, we're, we're socializing that, we're, we're putting that out there. Let us know when those things happen, real time, so that we can we can do what we can to, to help spread that. Sorry, I hope I didn't steal your thunder. <laughs> My thunder was I was gonna compliment Fish. And I, what I would say is our commitment is to promote the good and also to work to improve. So I would say, how many of you have won a local chapter, how many of you have won a local chapter award? Okay. How many of you won a, a national award, an individual award, you've been nationally recognized? All right, we need to know that, and I would ask you to set, as Travis is saying, ask you to send that to our attention, and we will work to promote that. I just wanna follow up, because I think the point you made was important about parents. We don't wanna just talk about the negative side of Greek life, we wanna talk about, and the question was asked, what do we see the value of Greek life? And I know Travis did a good job in addressing academic success, brotherhood, sisterhood, leadership, philanthropy, um, overall commitment to the institute. I mean, you guys show up at hockey games, you guys show up at events, you host community events. So I wanna just kind of reiterate that plug. We will communicate that to parents. We don't want, first of all, we want parents to be partners in this, but you're making your own decision. So if a parent says to you, look, I'm concerned, they're concerned because they care for you, but we wanna also make sure that you feel like you're making the right choice. So um, keep sending us those good stories, keep keeping us involved with the things you want us to know. This is that open dialogue that we've been talking about all night. Uh, out of curiosity, uh, for those that want to send these stories, where do we send them? Or where would you like us to send them? I would say send them to the Greek Life Family Task Force or you can send them to the DOC itself. Okay, yeah, so via uh, OGLC and then, or the DOC. Okay. Yeah. All right, so uh, I'm the president of a fraternity uh, and it's also suspended a long and arduous process, I'll say that. Uh, it's a very recent, uh, in respect to the gentleman's comments about holding, uh, you know, philanthropic or community service events, uh, our fraternity, uh, as a group of friends, not as a fraternity, specifically went um, to, to make sure that it was okay for us to host that to a church or pay event, uh, and it was outright denied. Uh, we went as a group of friends, um, not as a fraternity, uh, so, you know, hey, best of luck. Um, yeah. Yeah, well, basically we wanted, yeah, but we didn't have our letters up. Uh, we, we, 
obviously wouldn't be hosting it as the organization. Basically, it wasn't a free pass, uh, you know, not considered by the school, and for the event, it wouldn't have included that either. So, uh, well, I think that's what happened. understandable, but I mean, if it's if, if it's not a Greek house, then there's no way. But I, I get it. But I don't want to spend too long on that. That's not my question. Uh, as I said, it's been an incredibly long uh, process. Um, to me, it's very frustrating as the president um, to have to keep submitting, and, you know, editing, you know, 177 page documents. Uh, long story short, I want to know what the Greek Life Task Force is going to do, if anything, if they can do anything, uh, to help out that process, to aid um, fraternities and or sororities that are going to be uh, suspended. Um, just get through it a little bit faster because we're, I mean, our morale is crushed. We're getting killed uh, in recruiting. You know, I mean, it's just a nightmare. So anything we can get is, is good help. So usually when coming back to campus, that, go, that goes through OGLC, is that, am I correct? Okay. Is there anything that you're doing? No, so uh, <laughs> since, since being suspended um, and working with uh, the administration, I've experienced more delays, um, setbacks, uh, cancellations of meetings um, than I really have with any other organization, unfortunately. Uh, now that's not a try, I'm not trying to like sham or you know, be disrespectful, that's just the reality of my situation. Um, and you know, I assume that if we got all this done, you know, which we, we've met all the deadlines, if we can get all this in and, and get corroborate, you know, get this work done together, uh, as soon as we possibly could, then we'd be back on campus just that much sooner. Um, I can't tell you how many times it's you know, been a setback or something we're not expecting or hey, you know, we want you to have one, just one more thing, just another thing to keep going. Uh, by the way, you can't be doing this, you can't be doing that. All the while, I got my guys, you know, hey, when are we going to get back on? What are we doing? You know, hey, we just did all this work. You know, what are we going to get done? Um, and and I, I can't even get answers. You are currently in the process. Yeah, we're, uh, no, we're, we have our sentencing. Uh, we are past our two. You're two applying to come back. Yeah, we're applying to come back. Um, now, apparently, we've been really close for, I mean, five, six weeks. Uh, they had, when we submitted our reinstatement document, it was 165 pages. They had seven comments over two pages, and it's been four, uh, I think it were actually six weeks since we've heard anything back about our, our edits to that, so. So this is probably a much more appropriate conversation one-on-one, -on -one, though, as it is like times three now. Yeah. Uh, you probably know how to get a hold of me. To be honest, yeah, I, I probably do, yeah. <laughs> I, again, I, I don't want to get into the details. I just want to Let's talk not get into the details, but, but let me, let me be really help. clear. Yeah. Let me be really clear. Uh, a chapter that has been suspended. Yeah. Has gone through the judicial process. Yeah. Um, I think that we actually do more, and I don't think, I know. So for those of you who have said, I've been to other campuses, that, me too. In fact, I've been to hundreds of other campuses. I've either worked with them or I've worked as a consultant for them. So I understand different systems. And so people say, well, the institute doesn't do anything for Greek life. There's not many other institutions that would actually take the time to work with a suspended chapter. We do that. A decision to come back, a decision to return. There is a time limit placed in the sanction that says you cannot return until after this decision, or after this date, excuse me. That's not a guarantee. That doesn't mean you can come back after that date. And, and uh, it's, it's really up to whether or not we believe that you can come back and be a productive member. And for as much as I appreciate the number of pages that uh, you know, any document has, it's not about quality or quantity, it's about the quality. We have to know that organization is going to come back and live up to the community expectations. But feel free, let's have a conversation offline so that we can figure out exactly what's happening with your chapter. Okay. And okay. So, from, yeah. Just to clarify, we are not the Greek Life Task Force. Like, Jack and I. Well, this men. is. Well, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Jack and I were members of the task force, uh, but this is IFC and Pan Health. Uh, in terms of um, getting your chapter back, back into the IFC, um, that is done via the OGLC, so the Meredith's office will go at that. Uh, I guess we'll, if we, we can aid you with that process, but in terms of what specifically you need, that's done through her office and um, with, with the dean of students. We don't play much of a part in that. Thanks. Never really have, yeah. How are um, social members getting out of the loop? Closer. Oh. Okay, well. Uh, Ste step down, maybe. Okay, well, uh, it's stated early in the Greek Life Task Force like document, not the official, but the draft that the big thing is financial stability in my houses. We want to increase that. 
Yeah, I know, not being from a small house, but a lot of houses are still not financially stable even right now without sanctions put in place. With deferred recruitment and pushing social events to a third party like licensed vendor, which has obviously increased social costs greatly, it seems like those are that's a conflicting argument with what is stated in the Israel task force. So like it just seems to me that it just seems that RPI is trying to push liability off of itself for the Greek houses without actually expecting the social of safety of the students to improve at all. And it's just being veiled as, oh yes, it is, because we're moving to a licensed vendor. Because, I mean, if, if you can't get kids in the fall and you've been and you can't afford to live in your house or like your house and stuff like that, and you can't afford to have a social budget, what happens at that point? It just seems like, or my question was gonna be for just the IFC panel, not necessarily how you represent us, but do you think the Green Life Task Force is actually adhering to what is stated or they're just using data mani manipulation and false promises to get through, through the houses? point that we are at right now in terms of, let's say for instance art classes. We've already allocated thousands of dollars for the subsequent rush under the impression that we would be able to do freshmen. I mean that alone, along with the summer arts plans for not allowing communities to live in, which would be a certain percentage of all houses of income, would be bringing in tens of thousands of dollars. And last president's meeting, so the last open forum that we had, we confronted the task force about addressing these financial instabilities. Uh, we were told by one of the members of the task force to figure it out. I'll leave it at that. To figure out our cuts. I also have a follow-up just for anyone. If, uh, do you think that the Greek Life Task Force has shown that other areas of RPI has experienced the same problems? Do you just think that since Greek Life, you know, if you were associated with a fraternity and you'd like, oh, you're talking to X fraternity at X university, you're not really associating it with the university because now with the way that you hear about either bad things or stuff with fraternities or sororities in general, that it's usually, oh, it's this house with its letters or that house, not the university. Do you think that's why it seems like there's no athletics task force because you actually wear RPI letters and that actually represents them rather than Greek houses? Honestly, with, with the position that we're in right now with chapters, I mean, we all wear a set of letters. We all know what those letters mean. And these are groups of people that we spend four years of our life with really understanding each other and really coming to foster relationships. That's what we are. We are groups of people that have the same values and we care tremendously about each other and we live together and eat together and breathe together every day. And it just so happens that we're not wearing RPS letters anymore. That's what it stands to me. So, um, so let me just say a couple things. First, I, I appreciate the, the kind of points that you brought up in terms of deferred recruitment, uh, you know, social events of third party vendors. And I hear this kind of a frequent sort of, of students, you know, criticism of, of, well, it's the institution trying to, to kind of defer or get rid of liability. So first, what you should understand is that we should all be trying to reduce liability. And by the way, we're, we're in a much better place in terms of a lawsuit of something that happens at your house or with your event than you are. We're actually concerned much more about you and your liability than we are our own liability. Um, when we had the NIC here, the North America or the North, yeah, the North American Attorney Conference was here as part of those discussion panels, and one of the students asked, "How would you uh, best, you know, mitigate? What are the best practices for mitigating uh, 
risk during a social event with alcohol, both representatives from the NIC stated really specifically, <laughs> third party catering at a third party venue. So I, I get what their policy says, that they, you know, they're finally getting around to saying hard alcohol is a problem, something that we actually have had as a policy in our SEM and in our AOD policy as an institution for many years. There's nothing wrong with us trying to limit your liability and our liability. I think that's actually really smart. The other point I would make, oh, there it is. Um, the other point I would make is there are hundreds of campuses that have deferred recruitment. They made the transition. You will too. You'll do fine. Here's what I'll tell you. That second point about finances and social life, that's not why you're here. I'm not suggesting you shouldn't have social life, but parties with alcohol is not why you, you exist. And if you think that is, that's a problem. Because me. that's not what we think you're here for. Excuse me, uh, Dean Epper, the concern with finances is, strictly re is not related to that. It's regarding how we can sustain our chapters and regular regulations about the finances from ribbons and from the new member yeah. class in the fall. That's completely different and, from what and, and he also mentioned the cost of going to third party vendors for social activities right. with alcohol. Okay, um, I have two primary um, questions, comments, concerns. So the first one is with the Good Samaritan policy. So I am a freshman here at RPI and I am a new member of the Chi Phi fraternity. And at our orientation um, as new students at RPI, um, all of the students did um, an orientation about um, alcohol safety. At that orientation, we were told about the, new Samar the Good Samaritan policy. We were told how it protects us, it protects us people, our, us students, when we want to do the right thing and help other people. Keep everybody at this campus safe. Now, as I understand it as a freshman, there have been some changes to this policy. So currently, it protects people, individuals, students. Whereas in the past it has protected both individuals, people, students, in addition to organizations, specifically Greek organizations. So this change, um, from, from just what I felt here as a student here, I felt a pervasive kind of culture of fear among the entire Greek community and the RPI community as a whole due to this change in the Good Samaritan policy. It causes people, anybody who is affiliated with a Greek fraternity, with a Greek organization, a Greek fraternity or sorority, would be somewhat more afraid to report any incident under the Good Samaritan policy. Whether or not that person who they were reporting about is a brother, a sister, or a non-affiliated person, whether or not that event had anything to do with a Greek organization or a Greek organization event. This has caught, th this is problematic as I see it. It makes everybody at this campus less safe. So everything that I've heard from the administration, from IFC, from the Greek Life Task Force, at the end of the day, it's about the people. It's about making sure that everybody is safe Everybody is well supported. Everybody does well here academically. Everybody does well here mentally. Um, this policy, this change in policy, inherently is against everything that the um, that that those um, goals are set to to help because of that culture of fear against reporting anything, in fear of sanctions against your brotherhood or sisterhood or any Greek organization on campus. So um, the, my, my first question I'd like to just put out there is to ask the IFC what their opinion on this is. And um, yeah. incident 
Um, there have been strides that we have tried to make in order to address set insecurities from the Stochastic perspective, like implying that there are certain um, there are certain benefits that you'll receive as a member of the organization, but at the end of the day, uh, depending on the incident, it is going to be a very difficult issue for each chapter to handle in that regard. Um, I know I think you have a bit of a question. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, just inherently, I think it creates doubt no matter what's happening. I know everyone would it, it would like to do the right thing, but it still creates doubt, which is what the Good Samaritan policy is supposed to get rid of. It's supposed to make it so you have no doubt in your mind that you're going to call any local help that you can get. Uh, I've been advocating for that kind of to, that change to be removed, but that has not happened yet. Thank you. Um, if the oh, okay. Thank you. If the administration would like to comment on that. Can I make a comment first? So I was just gonna say, first of all, thank you, Noah, for sharing your concerns. Very proud you were able to come up here, as one of our new members, and expl explain your concerns in front of everyone. That was very thank great you. of you. Number two, so um, I don't know if you guys know what the Greek senator is, but I interface with the student senate a lot. The student life committee actually was working, from what I'm aware, on some kind of proposal to revise the Good Samaritan policy. I don't think anything actually happened with it. If someone here is from the student life committee, you can say something, but from what I'm aware, after this, I think we should convert this into some kind of action. Seems like everyone can agree that we should revise and work on the Good Samaritan policy. I'm very willing to work with anyone in this room. We're gonna be forming something after this to actually focus on this. And I think we should work with these guys to try and actually make this a reality. Mm -hmm. And one more comment is that that also um, perpetuates that culture of wanting to um, post stuff at um, non-Greek affiliated um, housing, which again, like many people have echoed here before tonight, may make those events less safe which again is the primary concern that everybody has about Greek life in the first place. Would anybody, okay. So, um, so let me just explain that to my knowledge, there's not been a change of the, of the Good Samaritan policy. However, um, you, you are correct in the way that it's applied. So for individuals uh, who call to get help for a friend, both them and the individual who is, uh, well, it actually doesn't have to be a friend, call for anybody, right? Mm -hmm. Who's in need of medical assistance due to alcohol or drugs, uh, they would be protected from judicial action as well as the individual who needs the help. And it would also mitigate the consequences for an organization, but you're right, it does not completely take them out of the judicial process. Okay. But there has not been a change in the, in the policy. So is it just uh, a change in how it's applied? Oh, is it just a change in how it's been applied? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. So. Okay. What was? What I just said? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, so yeah. So I, um, Brian Johns was here. Brian. Brian. Brian Lott. Brian Lott. Um, we've had some conversations about uh, looking at it. We have been looking at it as a part of um, of what we're doing in terms of the overall alcohol and drug policy. We're also looking at um, some affirmative kinds of, of um, portions to add to the Good Samaritan policy. So you know, one of the things that we, we gleaned when we were having conversations with our colleagues at MIT, they actually have a portion that not only does it protect folks who call and get somebody help and protect that person who gets help, if you're aware, they also have a part policy that if you're aware that somebody, reasonably aware that somebody should get medical help and fail to that, people who are struggling in their academics flock to Greek life because it supports them and keeps them where they currently are, or even better than they would otherwise be. <laughs> similarly, similarly um, we see statistics about alcohol abuse. Maybe it isn't that people who are in Greek organizations are more inclined to abuse alcohol or other drugs because they are in that Greek organization, but that people who are inclined to abuse those substances join Greek organizations for the support that they give. Um, a lot of, uh, I, I, as a STEM school, uh, I find it really troubling when we take statistics and we do really bad analysis like this that wouldn't hold up in our classrooms, and so I don't think it should hold up in our discussions. And I was wondering what IFC um, thinks about this. Uh, I agree.
had a couple of questions, and I think I've forgotten them all. I've been one so long. Um, anyway, um, I, I do, I want to go back to the fact that uh, this is supposed to be a discussion of Greek Life Task Force and asking questions re related to that, and especially having uh, some of the administration people here. And that uh, two things that I want to say before I ask the question, okay? One is to everybody, we will get over it, okay? We're going to get, I'm going to, oh, I didn't identify myself. My name is Bob Decker, I'm chapter advisor at Sigma Chi. I've been involved in Sigma Chi for 50 years. Uh, I'm vice president of the Alumni Inc. of Greek Council on campus, along with uh, Roger and Mike, who is uh, also on the board with us, okay? So I've seen a lot of things, uh, been through a lot of things, experienced a lot of things. Um, we will get through this, okay? We are gonna, we will make it a better Greek system by the time we get done, right? I'm gonna put a lot of trust in the administration that they are really gonna work with us to do it as they have said so. And I have, I can tell you from working with the IFC for the past two or three, three years now, that they have really made tremendous strides in their activity, their organization. And I mean, if you looked at it, how many people who are seniors ever knew that it, there could be a president's forum that the IFC would sponsor, okay? That would now the IFC uh, board and executive committee is starting to do some stuff. And I think a lot of what we're talking about today ought to be follow-ups. You know, people have got a lot of issues. We, you know, you can pick those out and you have different topics that you talk about. But I want to talk about uh, deferred recruitment for one second and the recommendations, okay? And this, is, this, this goes especially to people who are on the task force, all right? Um, I've heard from multiple sources that the recommendation related to deferring recruitment uh, when it was submitted to the executive committee, okay, which was the vice president's, that that recommendation said deferred recruitment starting in the spring of 2021. So my question is, for those of you that were on the, the, uh, the, the task force, is that true? And if it is, who changed it? How did it get changed, first of all? And number two, who changed it? it so, so the question is, did the original uh, recommendation from the, from the task force say deferred recruitment the fall, starting in the spring of 2021. Yes, no? Th that's not my recollection, Bob. My, the way that it's written is, is my recollection of how it's been written. Okay, because I've, I've, again, multiple sources who were involved in it and saw that stuff are saying that's not the case. Okay, maybe we can talk about that a little more. And then number two is we talk about, the other is uh, the AIGC, <clears throat> a few of us put together for the, the five star chapters, uh, the five star, sorry it was just the fraternity, it's because it was um, uh, the, board mem the board members who, who were available at the time, put together the five star applications from last year for the three chapters that won the five star. And it, each one was 100 pages long or longer Okay, and we specifically presented those to the, the you know, I think John, you got one, uh, um, Travis, one went to Lenore and Strong, and the purpose of it was so that you could see the good things that we did as we were engaging in conversations and writing the, the task force recommendations or the ultimate recommendations from the executive committee. The question is, did those really get read? Because they did talk about a lot of positive stuff that seemed to have sort of disappeared. That's all. So, so I know I did my reading, Bob. And um, what I would say is that you know, we, we recognize there are absolutely some fantastic chapters here, as we've said over and over. We have a pretty big system, especially considering the size of school. There's a lot of variability. And so, yes. I could say I read, I'm sure that, that John, did you get a copy of this? He read. I know John, Dylan. <laughs> um, While he's driving. So yeah, they, they were very informative. 
We also can read all of those that are three and two and one star, right? And that's very informative as well. Well, you did read them. Uh, I didn't read all of them, but I read some of them for sure. You only got three. Yeah, I I, I, I tend to have access. (laughs) Okay, and we can talk about the other. The other thing I wanted to point out, you, you had kind of congratulated the IFC for putting together a President's Forum. I wanted to say the Panhellenic also is, is sponsoring yeah, this I'm and they are also here and I think that they, they should also be recognized for that. You all should. You know you should. We have 15 minutes, it's what it is. <laughs> So my question is more for the administration and is another question about deferred improvement. So sorry in advance, I guess. Um, <laughs> so it's been brought up already, but yesterday the Greek Life Commons published like a, I'm not sure it was a draft or it was an official copy of their of their like plan for deferred improvement. And in there it clearly states more than once that freshmen or incoming freshmen are going to be barred completely from attending recruitment events their first semester. Um, so. It, I can personally attest to the fact that if deferred improvement had been a thing during my semester and I wasn't able to attend recruitment events my first semester, that the chances of me eventually joining the fraternity would have been far, far lower, if not maybe zero. Um, I mean, people before me have been saying the same things. Um, I know there's also a lot of people that have been attesting to the fact that how hard it's going to be for their houses to cope with this financially, just the the reduced amount of membership and stuff like that. People are worried about, you know, what their house is going to look like 10 years down the road. Is it still going to be the same or is it going to be a shell of itself because of the reduced revenue? Um, so my, my question is, so given the fact that all the recommendations you guys have put forward have been under the air of improving Greek, uh, Greek life, both in the short term and the long term, um, can you sort of give me an explanation as to how deferred improvement is going to improve Greek life despite all the negative repercussions I just mentioned? So let me just start with how many of you were actually at that forum yesterday with, with the Greek common staff? And, and so my understanding is that, that yes, they, they shared something that we've been actually working with, uh, with them. Uh, we've been communicating with the AIGC about, uh, with some student leaders. And, and let me be really clear about this. That's still rolling, right? Um, that was a draft of what is likely to, to kind of become a set of policies and guidelines around deferred recruitment. We know that we don't have a final decision on the recommendations, but if we wait until a final decision comes out about deferred recruitment and the direction is you need to implement it in this coming year, the 1920 academic year, and we wait until the end of this semester, we've waited too long to help you as much as we can help you now. And so I instructed the staff, and I've been working with them, like I said, the AIGC and other student leaders, to start to, to develop what we need to do now to support you to transition to the court of recruitment. There are things we have to do this semester. I think that we need to bring in some outside folks who are experts on recruitment. In addition to Panhellenic MPC uh, folks who help Panhellenic chapters transition, I think that we need to bring in some folks at our cost to help you as a system, to help you as chapters. So please, I saw some things on social media. It was not the Greek Life Office grading policy and saying this is it, that's not what was happening yesterday. It was the Greek Life Office trying to say, look, we're trying to anticipate that this is coming down down the road and and we want to help make sure that you can transition as successfully as possible. And hopefully you also heard some of what I just said. We want to invest in how we get some people here to help (coughs) us. Because let's make it up for a second. Let's say there is no deferred agreement, which I think that's probably not the case. I think there will be. Let's say there isn't. When I look at the, the recruitment data from the last several years, especially in IFC, you need help and I want to help you. It's not, a, it's not a criticism, it's just a fact. Many chapters are not recruiting to their potential and they could be. And so, uh, so let me answer your question in terms of financially, you'll make this transition, I promise it'll be fine. If you work to, to you know, recruit, you actually build a process that will attract today's students and tomorrow's students, the deferred recruitment transition will will not affect your chapter. If you do nothing, or you continue to do nothing more than you're doing now, and you haven't been successful as a chapter, 
that is not that is not because of recruiters here. If you look at your chapter and the productivity of recruitment over the last several years, and you have not lived up to your potential, deferred recruitment is not your problem. It's because you have to change your methods. Okay. Um, in terms of, of, of how it will help Greek life, I don't know if, uh, other than the fact that people will have more opportunity to really explore Greek life, understand it better, um, have opportunity, especially for, uh, for those joining ISC organizations, to, to actually visit more of those organizations and get to know them. Uh, I think those are some of the biggest benefits. And let me also be clear that what we're talking about in terms of the policies or the, the guidelines is, not, um, is nothing like if you see a freshman in the first semester of, of their, of their you know, first year, you have to run the other way. That's not what we're talking about. Do we want you to invite them over for a recruitment event? Probably not in that first semester. Are we encouraging the councils and even maybe there be some chapter-based sorts of, of informationals, uh, things that promote Greek life? Yeah, yeah, we've been talking a lot about how do we promote Greek life um, in, in kind of broad ways as well as, as you know, activity and event kind of, of format. So I actually, and I think we envision that the fall semester for first, sem first semester freshmen um, will actually expose them to Greek life maybe even more than it does now. Uh, in terms of the whole, okay. I, I think if I, if I can jump up and follow the question, yeah. is that so, I mean, in my opinion at least, I was someone who didn't join until my sophomore year and I basically did what the deferred recruitment would be is in I spent my first two semesters looking around at different houses. Um, but at the same time, I also knew a lot of people who joined their first semester and they're some of the best members of their houses. So I just don't see why you think it's necessary to take that decision away coming freshmen. I mean, some peop people are ready, going to be ready at different times, and I don't think it's right to tell them that they have to wait if they're ready. I mean, people do, there are people here who, you know, do research about prep before they even come here, and they already know what house they want to join, so I, I'm not sure if it's right to take away that right, their right to pursue that, their first semester. <laughs> Dean Epcar, if I may. Uh, what student leaders were consulted in creating of the deferred recruitment policy? What's that? Which student leaders were um, a part of making the deferred recruitment policy? Because Caroline and I had no say in it, and then when we offered our opinions to it, nothing changed in the policy. You talked about what was out yesterday? What? What, what was handed out yesterday? Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. So that, yeah. Well, that was well, sent to so us. So I about think you answered my question. You were consulted. It sounds like it wasn't necessarily incorporated. And, and we can talk more about that. Well, I thought what you just said was we you were actually gave. Well, uh, say, say again. I'm sorry. John, so just to clarify, when you said before that students, uh, student leaders aided in creating this deferred plan. That's not what I said. I said we've been talking about how do we help make sure that we're ready for the transition. I have, I have been having conversations with Vish and others about that. No, I did not say they helped create that draft plan. But we want your input, no question, okay? Okay. That is not, that is not the final plan. That is a draft. Okay, good. It should have been presented yesterday. What I actually have heard from several students today was that it was presented as a draft. And, and, and we want a lot of feedback and we'll get your feedback. It was presented as a draft, and then Caroline and I were expected to answer all of the questions about said draft. It was a tad ridiculous, to be honest. Okay. Uh, so, so let's talk about that. I mean, that's true. There's people in line. We can talk about We can talk anytime, right? <laughs> all right. So you mentioned that one of your reasons for deferred recruitment was to give people more of an opportunity to explore the different Greek organizations. If they can't attend recruitment events at said organizations, how would they be able to explore them? I think, I think we, we have to have some time where we're actually just sitting down talking about 
what, what defines recruitment events? What are informationals? How do we publicize Greek life? How can Greek life have certain activities that, that students, first semester included, can be at? I, I think that we have to expand beyond our, our current kind of concept of what constitutes recruitment. And what currently constitutes a recruitment event is typically an event at a house sponsored by that particular activity to recruit for that particular activity. And what we're saying is there's a lot of other options that are community-wide and, and can be done in the first semester. And also, my, my second question is, one of the reasons cited for deferred recruitment in the task force report was, quote, so students would, quote, develop a college GPA, end quote. And many houses, they have academic chairs, they have textbook libraries. There's members of every Greek organization, 48 every class here at RPI. If you're not allowing first semester students to form relationships with those houses through recruitment events or whatever other events, then you're depriving them of a big academic resource. I think that Greek Life sponsoring study groups, <laughs> Greek Life sponsoring study groups and, and um, time management skill workshops and organizational skills workshops and all of those things sound like great ideas we should explore. Okay. Thank you. Hello. My name is Emmanuel Rodriguez, and I have an issue regarding, it has to do with Greek housing. If I didn't have Greek housing, I wouldn't be able to afford being here. In fact, During this summer arch, I'm being forced to live on campus in housing that's more than two and a half times the amount that I'm paying now in Greek housing. And I'm doing everything to afford it. My mom is single-handedly paying for two kids that are in college. I'm working, I'm an executive board member in my fraternity. I'm trying to do well in school, and I'm trying to get a co-op or internship for the fall. And I decided I'm gonna try to become an RA. And then, I was misinformed by one of the assistant deans of when the RA application was due. And then I couldn't do that either. I was turned away in tears by the Res Life office because I couldn't apply to be an RA and I had to pay this housing that I couldn't pay. And then I went to my student advisor who sent me to the main office who said they would talk to the arch director for me and I emailed them trying to follow up and I still haven't heard anything. So my question is, who do I have to go to so I can live in my Greek house and actually afford to be here? I feel like if it was deferred, you'd be depriving so many people of the same opportunity I had to actually be able to afford to be at this school, because it's such an expensive school. Emmanuel. Emmanuel. So, so I absolutely appreciate the, the financial uh, difficulty that you're sharing. And, and you know, as a first generation college student, the, the son of, of eight kids to one you know, single parent who put myself through college, I, I, I absolutely appreciate where you're coming from. And I want to talk to you about that and see what I can do to help. Okay. Thank you. Here's what I want to say. Let, let's, let's be respectful, please. Um, let me say just a little bit separate. When we talk about things like the financial stability of houses, some of, of our concern is with houses that actually aren't charging enough to be able to, to put money away, to put a roof on every 30 years, and to replace their boiler on a timely fa fashion. So yes, I think it's a great opportunity if they can do both, offer less, uh, offer housing for, for less than it would get either on campus or off campus. We also still have to be thinking about how are, you, how are you able to pay the bills in that house? How are you able to make sure that you're investing in the physical structure so that it's safe? And this is not, Emmanuel, this is not your issue, but, but you, you just reminded me because people often talk about we're providing sort of cheaper housing. Well, cheaper housing doesn't always mean adequate housing. Again, separate from your issue, I want to talk about that offline and figure out what we can do to help. I mean, I have an air conditioner, so I should be able to live in during the summer. This is expensive. I don't have like a risk management form, and like actually, you guys come in, check out the city.
safety of the house. So we can sorry, I, I does, doesn't the like risk come in and check the safety of the house, the fire safety, and then approve if it's livable? Therefore, if somebody were to approve being able to live there, they should be able to live there. Yeah, and, and we've had to actually close some houses. Yes, yeah, so I don't understand how he wouldn't be able to move into his house over the summer. That's not what I just said. The same, the fact that that's not what I just said. Safe. Well, no, you brought up the mention of the fact that if the house isn't safe, then he shouldn't be living there, which is a good point. Okay, well, it's not different, okay, fine. Different thing than um, as the dean of students, it was his question over here. So I want to thank you guys for hosting this forum because it's really important. And I want to thank the administration for also being here because it's equally as important. Uh, <laughs> so a little backstory to what I have to talk about. Um, about a year ago, I attended the AIGC Leadership Summit uh, that was hosted here on campus. And as an executive board member of my fraternity, I was trying to figure out what all was going on with our PI. And one of the biggest concerns that was raised during that meeting, from the point of view, at least from the, the Greek community, was housing during the Summer Arch, as was just mentioned. Uh, and one of the suggestions that was made for moving forward with that forum was to create a transparent forum between the administration, IFC and Pan Health, as well as the Greek community at large, so that we could better understand what RPI is planning to do and how to address on our front and yours moving forward financially in a safe manner. Um, every week I was talking to Sean, the IFC president, asking what's the status of this meeting? And every week I would get a response, I'm waiting to formalize a date and time, I'll let you know when I find out. And that was about a year ago and until this point there's only been a very few amount of these forums and they're really important because they make it so that the Greek community can know what's going on. And to this date, I still don't really know what's going on with housing for Greek students, and that's a problem. And from all of this, I, I, I don't want this question to be focused specifically about housing, because while that's important, it's not the only problem. And I say this to address both the administration and IFC Pan Health. How do you plan to move forward being transparent with the expectations from both the community IFC Pan Health, the administration, and the Greek Life Task Force. So I'll ask you from, from IFC's end. Um, any issues that we are planning to do, uh, again, as I said before, um, we're going to be sitting down and going through what all of you have said, and we'll be looking into what we can do in the future. Again, like I said before, if there's anything that you'd like us to do, let us know. Um, if you want my email, phone number, you know, I can give that out more than willing to. Uh, but going in the future, we will be uh, issuing monthly reports on the projects that we're doing. We want to make sure that our community knows exactly what we're doing. Uh, so we'll be issuing monthly reports telling you guys, hey, this is what we're doing. This is an in initiative that we've talked about, wanted to talk about, and we were about to, we were planning to kickstart it off once we had this form here. Right. So we'll be doing that on our end, making sure that um, what's the, uh, we will be communicating exactly what's going on from our end to you guys. Um, and hopefully in the future, um, if we create a all Greek mailing list, they'll be going out to everyone. Um, and that's currently in the works. Again, I've been having regular meetings with se several fraternity presidents as well as the director of the arts program. Again, for this summer, it does not seem that we will be able to live in our houses, unfortunately, but we are working currently on a comprehensive plan to allow us to live in in 2020. If we were not allowed to, that's a different story, but if things are looking up, and we will be continue to prepare these resources so that we can potentially at least be prepared for that possibility. So if you want to get involved in that, I'm spearheading that effort with a few other members of IFC and some fraternity presidents who are welcome to join. I also want to let you know it is 10 o'clock. Um, we, we do want to hear your concerns. So right, let's so get up real quick. As the Dean of Students, you've heard tonight many comments and concerns about not only Greek life, but RPI students in general. Can you promise us that as our dean that you will lay this information through proper channels and push for the investigation to your students want? Investigation for what your students want. You've heard a lot of different like uh, complaints about like the Good Samaritan policy or how like Troy is becoming more dangerous and a lot of problems are happening off 
like off campus, or not so close to campus that can pose like a potential threat to the students. Will you rely this information to proper channels and push for an investigation for anything that students have mentioned today? Absolutely. I think many of these things we're already in the process of. But yes, I took a lot of notes. So did Vice President Jaworski. Um, so, so the answer is yes. Thank you. You all have heard a lot of concerns as well. And I'm hoping that you will reciprocate that same sentiment that you will look at where you can make dif differences and changes in, in your students. Is that a maybe yes? Yeah. Sorry, this is also gonna be up about deferred recruitment, but um, I felt like I had to share. So my understanding of the reason for deferred recruitment is to give freshmen more time to get acclimated to the school, which is great. And I'm speaking to you as a freshman who joined my first semester um, uh, to Pi Phi uh, as RPI. And um, as a woman, especially on this campus that's predominantly male, I knew right away that I not just wanted to go Greek, but I needed to go Greek to find a supportive female community on this campus. Um, <laughs> so, although I and many of the other women on campus knew right away, some people still needed extra time, which is great why we had sort of a delayed rush mid-semester um, around October and November. Um, and I think we all really benefited from that. So um, right now, your rationale um, is that deferred recruitment for the spring will allow freshmen more time to be acclimated. But I'm confused because we already have informal rush in the spring for those particular students who need the extra time. So my question is really, why does the Greek Life Tax Force believe that deferred recruitment will benefit the community um, and the underclassmen? Because it seems like, number one, we already accommodate for those students who need the extra time because they have the choice to make it, whether fall or spring. And two, um, that those of us who joined first semester freshman year so heavily relied on the supportive system of our houses um, that not allowing the option of a supportive system to arrive to freshmen upon arrival on campus would be detrimental to the well-being of our future students. So was delayed recruitment to mid-semester considered? And if it was, why isn't that the suitable solution? Yeah, so, so uh, delayed to mid-semester was considered. I think that what we heard was a lot of kind of, it was very, uh, it interfered with midterms, interfered academically a great bit across the system, not necessarily with your chapter, but, um, but across the system. Um, have you read, and I'm not trying to call you, have you read the, the report? I'm very new to this. This is my first time getting involved, but I still wanted to speak. So, so. there's, a, so there, so there's, there's rationale in the report for how the task force actually came to decide that they would re recommend deferred recruitment. I can't speak for the task force. I was on it, I didn't run it. But what I would say is that uh, I think that after a lot of conversation about both what would be best for our students by way of them being RPI students and still accommodate you know, Greek life and be able to, to help Greek life uh, sustain membership, if not grow membership, which is our goal. Uh, that's how we you know, came to a deferred recruitment in the first year decision. Hi, I'm Sarah, I'm a fourth year architecture major. So I'm not a math major, but I also have a concern about the st statistics and how they're being used. And my concern is that we blame sexual assault and rape on the Greek culture by continually comparing Greek versus non-Greek st st statistics and statistics involving alcohol as well. Alcohol is not an excuse um, for rape and sexual assault and nor is it being at a Greek party. Um, overall, the cases being involved have not decreased since the task force. So I was wondering, um, my question is, should we be holding Greek members to a higher standard and stop indirectly blaming parties and alcohol for these cases rather than the individual and their inexcusable actions and how administration plans to hold people to these standards? Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more. The individuals are ultimately responsible, right? For, yeah. So um, that being said, I think that research would also tell us there are contributing factors. There are environmental contributing factors, things like alcohol, 
play a role in almost um, the, well, not almost, the vast majority of, of these cases. It's not an excuse, but it is something that you have to address if you're going to fight this, this issue. Um, environment, you know, what's convenient, where people are familiar, where they have access to be able to take somebody into a place and, and, uh, and actually perpetrate sexual assault or rape. Uh, also is, is something that, that leads to uh, whether or not it's successful. So, um, so you know, I, I think that, yes, we need to hold individuals absolutely accountable. We can't ignore the other environmental factors at the same time. We have to address all of those things. You're welcome. Hi, I'm Nick. It's gotten a pleasure to meet some of you guys before. Um, I had two, rather than questions, more just comments, ideas, because I actually was asking for them. Um, in regards to uh, the first being um, planning these kind of info sessions or programs for freshmen that cannot sign their bid the first semester. Um, I personally don't believe that info sessions are gonna be, like maybe as a one or two, but I don't think that they're gonna be the fundamental way of getting informed about gig life. Um, I would suggest using some of our major social events, maybe shifting, rebranding and shifting Reef Block Party to be an event that happens in the fall or something like that to get, show a presence on campus. Um, one of the problems with that rises with the other kind of comment is that it has become increasingly difficult for chapters to reserve spaces to host events or organize activities on campus. Um, we have, last semester we tried to reserve the alumni house for an event that we do, and after basically being ignored for multiple months, we were then told that we were not given, the, we were not allowed to basically use the room because they did not know what the Greek Life Task Force wanted, had to say about it. They, uh, somehow the administration, well not the, some, not the administration, somehow the staff thought that the Greek Life Task Force affected their ability to interact with us. <laughs> and that was a big issue for us personally. But that's also, that's a specific example, but it's also more general. Trying to book the Mueller Center for event this semester, or event what, next semester? So this is mainly directed towards the Greek Life Task Force, but at the last meeting um, before, or like before the end of the comment period for the recommendations, you did mention that you were trying to expand recruitment and citing how the 200 this past fall semester and how that compared to the 300 from the past two semesters. But what I'm really questioning is the rationality behind delaying the rush period until the spring, especially when we're at a time of such a parch where we are struggling to fill up our houses and have a large enough brotherhood.
telling us that we want to thrive and that you're going to want to help us, but that's not what we're seeing from your proposal. Like, we see deferred recruitment, and we're, we're all thinking, how are we going to survive? My house, like, we're struggling with numbers. We're struggling with having enough people to do the work around the place. And, like, we, we don't see how that's going to help us. We're honestly considering taking the risk of giving bids that first fall semester and I'm sure other houses are. I guess what I would say is you take the most of the risk of putting all your travelers in school and not have that move. I'm saying if you don't have the money, if you've already gone off. Why, why would you carry on that proposal if you are creating that sort of environment? Why would you enforce or enact a proposal to defer rush periods when? Yes, I am. I un I understand your your reasonings and your rationality, but like in reality, like that I, I don't see why that why deferring rush uh, rush period would actually help us or help us advance numbers get more people to go green. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, it seems like we're at the end of our forum. Uh, again, thank you, first of all, to VP Conworthy, uh, Susan Strong, Dean Apgar, VP Kolb, I, you know, I really appreciate that you guys were here to answer our questions, hear our concerns. Um, you know, I to also, shout out to our PI TV, shout out to the Poly, thank you guys for being here, thank you for providing likes, uh, and shout out to all you guys, really appreciate it. Have a good night.